I want to make an announcement for tomorrow night. The planning board is hosting an informational forum tomorrow night about the business district. We want to get some information from the people, both residents of the town and business owners in the town, about the kinds of things we should be looking for and talking about in any revision or any addition to the business A districts. And there are two of them. They're both fairly small. One is on Route 77 and one is on Cottage Road. So if you have any interest in that, please do come tomorrow night. This is strictly informational. We're going to be taking notes and having charts and just eliciting as much information as we can and we hope we have people hanging from the ceilings for that so we urge you to come okay minutes of the oh let me just announce we've had a lot of emails from people um, and I don't know that I have the whole list except for this and I can well there are more though that came earlier um, we have a letter from mr. And mrs. Jordan regarding comfy Cape, a letter from M. Fashk regarding Comfy Cape, a letter from J. Ingalls regarding Comfy Cape, a letter from J. Moody regarding Comfy Cape, a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Orr regarding Rudy's, um, a letter from Anne Marie Rosenfeld regarding um, comfy, cozy, comfy Cape. Uh, we have a couple of um, in fact, we've had a number of, um, somebody help me on these letters. The, well, letters regarding Comfy Cape from a number of people. And I have them all with me. If anybody wants me to list them, I will. They are a matter of record. But we do have a number of them, too. Pardon? OK. And then in addition to that, we have, these are about the wetlands amendment. We have one from Carol Taylor, a letter about the wetlands amendment, Martha Duncan, um, David Clay, and Ruth Noble. Alice, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, from Alex Johnson about the wetlands amendment. I think, except for the letters about Comfy Cape, they were, they, it was almost a, it, it was a letter that was passed out to a number of neighbors that were signed, and we have many of them from the abutting neighbors. Okay, minutes of the last meeting. Um, do I have a motion to approve or any exceptions or any corrections or additions? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor. Okay. Well, I'll start with Comfy Cape Daycare. Uh, Kim Newman, will you please come up and just tell us a little bit about the project, and then we'll open the public hearing. Could you please speak a little louder? Located at 111 Scott Dye Road, and that's across from the Viking Nursing Home. And I am here to request an amendment to the site plan to just change the number of children that I care for from 12 to 20 uh, children. And I, I realize the um, major concern for most of the neighbors is uh, regarding noise. And um, I will address that. Uh, the increased number of children will not be all uh, preschool age, which currently we have a majority of preschool ages. We're going to try to accommodate for more uh, infants and toddlers. Um, so as far as the outdoor playtime, currently we take out a, a dozen kids at one time now. When we change over to a center, we're going to have an infant room, a toddler room, and a preschool room. And they go out in the, at the playground at separate times during the day, so they won't all be out. You know, you won't hear 19, 20 children out at once. You'll still have a group of, um, of course, four infants, so they'll, they'll be going for walk or, you know, stroller rides, but like five toddlers at one time or maybe up to like t uh, 10 preschoolers at one time. So it won't increase, you know, sounds outdoors, um, if that's the major concern. And as far as traffic and, and drop off and pick up, majority of our kids um, are siblings to, to a car usually. 
So you probably won't see too much as far as um, additional traffic coming in either. I, I think it's the, the, the changes are very minor. It might sound larger, but um, I'm asking for 20 because the license with DHS would read 20, but we really can't have 20 because the number of teachers that I'm, I'm going to have is three, and there's a limit to the number of kids per teacher, four infants, five toddlers, and 10 preschoolers. So that's at the max 19 kids. And um, so they're on a usual basis, you know, some are part-time, some are full-time, so it shouldn't increase, you know, sounds of outdoor enjoyment sounds for uh, people in the neighborhood shouldn't be, you know, I don't see any major changes there at all. Before we open the public hearing, are you making any changes on the site at all? The only site uh, changes that we're making uh, mainly is we just like to increase um, the size of the play yard. Our play yard slopes a lot, um, so if we could increase it a little bit, we could fit a little bit more equipment in. Would you uh, please tell us how much it is now and how much you plan to increase it? Yes. Um, it's about 1500 now. And uh, so we were planning to increase it to about 3,132. So more than double. Yeah, yeah. And also, could you talk a little bit about the lot line and the shed before we open the public hearing? Yes. Um, currently, we have a, a small shed. It's a metal one. We're going to take that down. Um, it sort of uh, is on our neighbor's property, slightly on the neighbor's property. There's We're going to take that down altogether. And then we're going to look into putting up a new shed, which I know I have to go through the um, uh, gentleman, Bruce Smith, that would have to come to approve it. But we're looking more to put that down towards the driveway end, uh, if that does get approved. Um, and with the, the, the request for the fence is um, if I could put it on my lot line, it would be handy because then it would give me that little bit of extra space for um, a swing set, you know, so the swings can go back and forth a little bit easier because of the sloped area. There's a lot of area in my backyard that I cannot use for any equipment because, because it's really, you know, slopey. Okay. Anybody else want to ask a question before we open the public hearing? I have one question. One of the things that we have um, seen indicates that there's going to be a reconfiguration of the parking. Can you explain, is, is there anything happening to the parking as it's currently on site? No, the parking is going to stay the same. We have ample parking. Uh, we're required to have three parking spots for employees, uh, two for our tenants of the um, second floor, and we have, you know, an additional parking for all that stuff. So we don't have any changes. So that's the same as on the current, the existing approved site plan? Yes. Yes. No, it, well, they didn't, right, they didn't do their changes. So we, when we purchase it, it's going to be the same as, as it has been. We don't need to make any, any changes. But the site plan that they had drawn up, they didn't um, uh, make their changes as they were planning to, the previous one. So what we drew up here just shows you what it currently has and why it doesn't need any changes. But that's already there? It's already there. Okay. Yeah, there's plenty of pavement to cover the parking that we, we need. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Two other quick things. S signage and landscaping changes? Yes. We, we would like to um, just increase the sign uh, slightly um, as, I, as I listed in the um, uh, request uh, here. And, uh, and no landscaping changes, but um, for the sign, um, I was thinking to enlarge the sign to a, a 30 by 35 rather than what we have now is a 20 by 31. <coughs> you didn't really answer my question about there was apparently a problem with the lot line. The lot line, we did have a uh, new uh, surveyor come out and draw up what you have uh, a to copy find. of. Because, um, mm -hmm. I, I looked at it before, but yeah. now I can't find yeah. it. There it is. Go ahead. Yeah. She has the updated version. Yeah, so you have the updated version there. I, mm -hmm. I don't have it up on the board because I, I just got the number of copies, but um, this, this uh, old plan only showed a straight line, and then your new copy shows the um, corrected 
line that the survey are just. Uh, and the play area is different on the second plan than it was on the first. The play area on this one is different from the play area on your second after the lot line was adjusted. Uh, no. No. It should be pretty much the same. Well, we've, well, we've changed it. We, show. I mean, we, are ch we changed it to show what we'd like to do to increase it. Well, the one on the first plan is also 3132 square feet. Okay, that, that's our change we made. On the, that first plan, is our, we, we show our changes we'd like to make. No, he shows a lot line that shows the original fence. Yeah. That's the original square footage, which is 15. Oh, I see. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, this is confusing because you've got the original on the right. plan that has the change in the lot line, yeah. and then on that one that doesn't have the error in the lot line, you're showing the new one. Right, and that is because... Um, I, I, at first, I didn't know I would need to have a surveyor come out, and we just did this at the very last minute and got this right in, just uh, basically to show you that, that we do know where the line is, okay. uh, the true line is, and that we won't, you know, overstep our boundaries. I have a, a question about the wetlands that are in here that I think is important to ask before we open the public hearing. Maureen, there's something in here that says the 100-foot buffer for an RP1 wetland is shown on the plan and the applicant is not proposing any activity within the buffer area, but an RP1 bu wetland has a 250-foot buffer. Yes, it has a 250-foot buffer unless you can get it reduced under one of the four existing criteria. Oh, that, the six feet. people, the yes, six buildings. Okay, it. never mind. Just to explain it to everybody here, the buffer is 100 feet because it's regarded as a heavily dense, a heavily dense area with six or more buildings surrounding it, which is why it can be reduced. I forgot about that. Okay. Anybody have anything else before we open the public I, hearing? I do, please. Um, I'm having a bit of a difficult bit of difficulty figuring out where your fence is going to be because I'm looking at the original site plan with what I think is your drawing showing where you want the fence to be, and it shows a 15-foot gap between your fence and the old lot line. But in looking at the new site plan with the, with the revised appropriate lot line, I'm looking just at your, what I think is your current fence, right? Can you tell me, you keep talking about putting the fence on your lot line. Is there 15 feet between the lot line and where you want to put the fence or no? What I'm requesting now that I've had a, an actual survey done mm -hmm. is just to move the fence back to the lot line and, and not have any buffer at all. Um, so you'll want, just to use the one that you have, the newer yeah. one, yeah, you'll the want one, the play area to come, come from the jog in the house all the way to the lot line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any landscaping on that lot line now that blocks yeah. out your neighbors from the oh, fence or from a fence? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of uh, privacy trees. And it, it goes all the way mm -hmm. down? Yeah. Okay, thank you. It was just hard. The, two dif the differences in the two surveys is... But if you yeah. put the fence on the lot line, if, if we give you permission to do that, then you're going to take out all the landscaping. No, no. We put it in front of the trees. On your side of the on trees? On our side of the trees. So then it wouldn't be on the lot line. Well, the, this is not the, clear. The trees have been planted there. The other lot, the landowner that owns the abutting property has put those trees in, so they're on his they're lot. On oh, okay. His side of so it's, the landscaping is not at all on your lot. Yeah. Our survey right. has put stakes exactly. in the ground to show us where the line is, and the line is uh, a bit in front of the trees. You know, okay, so you do have survey stakes there, so you yeah, know. Yeah, there's survey stakes. All right. all right, I'm good. That was my only Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Um, the revised survey line now has a jog in it. Yes. Two questions. I'm trying to figure out whether the change increased the size of your lot or decreased. I'm not sure if the jog pushed the line out or pulled the line farther toward you. That's a good question. It's a decrease. decrease. It looks like a decrease compared yeah. to the... It's a decrease. Okay, it's a decrease. It's 86. So the 86, 37, 30 west is the old lot line that projected all the way across. That's not what I'm seeing here. Well, the original was 282 and a half feet. It came in and decreased. Okay. 96. 86. 10 feet. 
Yeah. Okay. And is the surveyor the correct the, that there's the an evergreen is, the hedge that straddles the lot line as well as one evergreen hedge that's on the far side of the lot line? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So there really isn't a line. So some of the hedge is on your side mm -hmm. and some of it's on the neighbor's the side. The front hedge, yes. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. I'm good. Open the public hearing. Please come forward, state your name and address. Um, <laughs> please uh, clearly state your name, and if it's complicated, please spell it. Thank you. And your address. You don't have to spell your address. Okay. It's a little hard to hear. It's Mike and Mark Fowler, and we're at, uh, are we on the property of 2 Patricia Drive, which is directly behind the Newman property. Can you spell your last name for us, please? Fowler, B-O-W-D-L-E-R. Thank you. Those pictures you have are the same thing as he's hanging on the, on the pin board here. Contact group. Only bought them 20 years ago. Nothing left these days. Okay. Opposition to this proposed business expansion was predictable. And the reasons for this opposition are obvious and comprehensively covered in my letter to the planning board. I could read the letter, but reading letters is boring. But I will pre-say the situation. It's very, very clear that the, um, the three um, objections would be to the traffic, the extra traffic is undeniable, which uh, could cause ganging of traffic and slamming of doors. The noise factor from the playground activities, and of course the devaluing the property in the immediate vicinity. Um, some people are even talking about getting a tax reduction through that in the property devalue. <laughs> it befalls me as we are um, imme the immediately adjacent property to this proposed business expansion, so it befalls me to spear point the opposition. Um, and what we feel is that this area is presently a very pleasant residential environment and we want to pre preserve that tranquility. It is our joint feeling that today's modern zoning should foster the well-being of its folks. Otherwise, why have zoning principles? One can always build a case for zoning relaxation. For instance, the, the case in California was where someone applied for a zoning variance to build a, a house of, shall we say, a doubtful moral standing next to a church on the grounds that you could go into the one place and then go next door to pray for forgiveness. But the zoning decision should be based on what is reasonable. It is our stand that further expansion of this business would not be reasonable. Um, two people, two couples in that area are retiring soon. Uh, I'm even planning to retire in that area myself. Um, I trust that the board will not equate the gravity of this case with the length of my presentation. I'd like to just add one thing to that. I don't think we made it clear that these 
that are circled in red other properties that you probably have, all have letters of opposition, opposition on. There may be some others, but those are the ones we know of for sure. And that's why we handed those out to you. We did receive a, a number of this. It was the same letter, and then they just signed it okay. also. So we have a whole pile of, of them. Okay. And I guess if we add it up, would you three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve? The other thing we probably want to make clear is this property, the, the, the playground where it stands right now is, I believe, approximately five feet from our property line right now. And we're very concerned about that, of course, because that's the front yard to our home here. See, the vulnerability of these properties here, and even the ones surrounding here are concerned. But we have a direct problem with that expanding. Not only that, I mean, I realize that the playground is going to be used with maybe the same amount of children, but more times a day. So that just means more noise during the day instead of two times for recess to six times for recess. So anybody that's trying to take a nap or works a night shift or, you know, it's going to be kind of difficult. Some of the people back here have told me they close their windows because of the, the noise at times. And you need to hear from them tonight. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Other people would like to... Leave this up here? Oh, you, you're welcome to, yes, because some people might like to identify that they signed the, the letter. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak before you. My name is Sue Murray Barrett. Uh, my family built both four Patricia Drive and eight Patricia Dot Drive in the early 1960s, and I have to admit I was alive then. Um, currently, my widowed mother lives at eight Patricia Drive. I know Kim Newman very well, and I understand, you know, her wonderful success she has with her daycare. So I'm trying to keep this, the impact on the neighborhood, and I wanted to address a couple things of importance. I think we sincerely need to go. My mother could not be here tonight. I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth Shore in Shore Acres. My mother still resides after 40 years in, at 8 Patricia Drive. Um, I'd like to go back to when the Rancourts put their application in for licensing. My father worked extremely hard with this board, and the neighborhood made a significant compromise to allow the daycare to go in. The compromise had many important issues. One, there is wetlands. As I grew up here where my mother resides, there was a pond here that we could ice skate and play hockey games on. Through natural progression and through the expansion of people's property, adding a little bit of loam here, a little bit of grass seed here, there is no longer a pond there. My mother now floods out. Bob Malley will testify to this. They have to come every spring and they had to put a new culvert in to help my mother because the water does not flow down this Berwick River anymore. If you take a sight walk through, you can see the origination of the pond here that has now been filled over. Unintentionally, if they're um, doubling the size of the playground, that is going to further compromise the backflow to um, number eight. And you're welcome to take a walk through at any time. Secondly, the traffic pattern was extremely researched in the Rancourt application. If you look carefully here at 8 Patricia <laughs> Drive, there was a hammerhead here. And uh, my family's property still remains, uh, retains interest in the sides of 16 and 19 Patricia Drive. The intent of that hammerhead was for fire trucks and snow plows. It was not, when we gave up this property to put in the 1960s, to put the hammerhead there, it was not to make a commercial turnaround. My mother is a widow, she is aging, and the traffic pattern could be significant when the people can't pull out onto Scott Dyer Road and have to go down that road and turn around. So the second, first thing I really want everyone to do is go back. My father did so much work on the initial application, and the neighborhood really did make a compromise. They said residential daycare with the owner occupied. And everyone was very happy and very satisfied. The original owners got to make a living, and the neighborhood adjusted to that accommodation. The next thing I'd like the um, community to look at is the intensive daycares in Cape Elizabeth. If you look in by history, there was a daycare proposed in Brentwood West that was denied because it was in a neighborhood. Patricia Drive is the next street over from Brentwood West. It would be the same thing. And if it was denied in Brentwood West, why is the expansion allowed on Patricia Drive? Um, 
So um, I thank you for your time. I really wish you would go back to the intent of the Rancor application. My father did a tremendous amount of work in it. The wetlands is a huge issue. Uh, Public Works can support that. The traffic property and turnaround is a huge support. And doubling the playground, whether um, intended or not, is significantly going to impact um, the ownership of 8 Patricia Drive. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Albert Carville, and I reside at 19 Patricia Drive. 19 Patricia Drive is located right here. I have two concerns, one of which you've just heard. <coughs> when the original approval was given for the daycare, it was to be owner-occupied with a limited number of uh, children. And to see that expand, I think, uh, negates the great deal of work that went into the original proposal. I also share the same concern in regard to the wetlands. Susan is, is very right. Uh, there used to be a skating pond there, which is now filled in and continues to fill in on a regular basis. It's not going to get any, big, any smaller. And what that has done, it has backed up the water around the back of her mother's house, number 8 Patricia Drive, and is also backing it up behind number 19 and number 15 because, because of this fill-in down in that area. So I have two concerns, and I do think that the original application for the daycare should be reviewed and considered in light of uh, the work that went into that. And also, just when you drive down Scott Dyer Road, just take a look at what is happening and take a look at what is going to happen maybe 10 years from now when that fills in and the brook which comes down from up here uh, in this area, where is that going to go? Where it's going to go is right into the back of the homes in this area. And given that this is a wetlands, I'm not sure what recourse uh, the owners of that property are going to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anne Marie Rosenfield, and I live at 6 Patricia Drive. And um, sorry to do this. <laughs> um, you're such a lovely person. And um, the reason why I'm here, I work for Coldwell Bank a Residential Brokerage, so I sell real estate. And I know that the impact that businesses have on residential homes. So, what I, the reason for my opposition is the value of our homes. I also have a teenage son, unfortunately he wasn't able to be here tonight, he's at hockey, um, that is opposed because he feels the noise level with the children. It's just in the summertime, our, his bedroom backs out and the daycare's backs to us. And it just, I mean, it, it's happy sounds, but it's not something you want to wake up to first thing in the morning when you're a teenager. So um, <laughs> that is, um, that's our opposition. Could you point to your house again, well, please? I am right here. Okay. And unfortunately, I have not lived there that long. So, um, but it's a great neighborhood. Um, it's very quiet. And uh, I wasn't aware that there was actually a pond. I know that some people do have some issues with water. But um, I wasn't aware that there was a pond a while ago. So that is a concern. Thank you very much. Okay. Other people who would like to speak, please don't hesitate to come forward. I'm James Mooney. I decided to Would you say, would you spell your last name, Maureen? Do you need a spelling? M-O-O-N-E-Y. Thank you. I reside at 3 Patricia Drive, which is right here. And I also reference back to the original agreement when this was, in fact, it was hard fought. In fact, Mr. Rancourt, he was a little disappointed that he could only have up to 15 children. Was it 15? Was that the number? That was his top, of, that was what he was allowed. And it was supposed to be owner-occupied. Again, his son was going to be occupying the building. That was what the plan had been. And that was probably one of the few 
reasons that it was approved, that it was limited to that, that amount. And it is now turning into a, not a, a home daycare, but a daycare center. That's basically what it's going to become. Excuse me, can I allow Mr. Reginald to move back? Not right now. Thank you. And, well, that would be fine if she moved back in, but again, it was limited for a reason. And it was limited to no more than 15 heads. Now, we're going up to 20, and I think she said that the only reason why it's going to be 20 is because of the staffing. Well, the license from the staff. You know, it may yeah. Excuse me, why don't, can we staffing. just speak and then we'll, we'll have yeah. the... If you had more staffing, then you could probably have more kids by the state. So I'd, I'd like to know where, where it's going to end. Is it this the last increase, or is it can, can it continue to grow? Because it's, it's, there are times right now that it's quite noisy over there. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. It's not always, but there are times. Thank you very much. You. Other people who would like to speak? Are you sure? Can I speak again? Well, you were going to get you back up there. Anybody else who would like to say anything? Here's another person. This is for the public, not for the applicant. Yet. Yet. <laughs> My name is Claudette Valandry. I live at 14 Brentwood Road, which is parallel to a Patricia Drive. Um, my observation of the lot from the previous owner to the current ownership is distinctly different. And the maintenance does not suggest a sense of uh, ownership and, and pride in that. And I question the merits of a larger sign when virtually the existing sign, it seems to me if it only had larger printing, would be adequate for daycare. I question why is a larger sign needed for daycare. Um, and as far as there not being any uh, thought as to additional landscaping or concern is a question that I have in terms of the overall appearance and maintenance of a domestic dwelling which was the original intent. And uh, as an observer of Scott Dyer, I, I question those facts in addition to what everything that's already been stated. Thank you very much. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Are you sure? We're going to close the public hearing. Okay, now you can come back up again and we'll ask more questions. And, okay. um, Maureen, maybe you could review for us the original number, my understanding was at the beginning it was supposed to be owner-occupied. There, there was never any requirement placed on the approval that it be owner-occupied. The prior owner made representations that didn't actually plan out. But there was a representation by the prior owner that his son and his fiance were going to operate it. I don't think they ever did. And it wasn't a condition of approval? It was not a condition of approval. What, was, what number of children were allowed at maximum? Well, the, the original approval is the approval that is still applying to the current applicant, which was for 12 children. And anyone who owns it would have to comply with that original approval or come back for an amendment to the planning board. Isn't, isn't it a requirement of the zoning ordinance that the appeal in the operator's residence? No. Not if it's a daycare facility. Isn't that a conditional Re use? That's definition. a business? It is a conditional. If it's not. It's yeah, and, and I will I'll double check it right now. But I, I, don't, I know for a daycare facility, we have not required owner occupancy. Well, I'm reading the definition, and, and maybe I'm reading from the wrong reg. Daycare facility says a facility which provides regular program of care and protection, blah, 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 in the operator's residence. Or, or. Okay. Or. So it's district. 
Thank you. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> and does it have a number of children in there? I don't have my book open right now. Other than the operators. Response. No, no, no number. So it's the approval that we're dealing with. The, the, the well, it's the number and the change in Meaning the yard. It's and not the, a condition. And and the lot lines and. I think the, what we have is a daycare home, which was limited limited to twelve. And then after, and I actually know a daycare home. I think is limited to six. 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 And then six. above six, you're classified as a daycare facility, six. which is a conditional use. A daycare use. home doesn't require site plan review, but a daycare facility right. does. Yeah. Which is what the earlier approval was. Okay. Were there any other conditions at the time of the original approval? Oh yes, and I'd be happy to dig those out. Yeah. Um, They're included in. And you know, as for the original approval, the plan you see before you is pretty much the original approval um, because the applicant has taken the original plan, and the only thing they did is they they erased the lines that show the parking that the original applicant did not instruct as shown on the plan, and I instruct them that they should not be submitting a plan that doesn't show what they actually intend to do, and since they were not planning to build the parking that the prior owner had had promised to build and instead had purchased the lot with a different parking configuration that the prior owner had constructed and the town never cited them for it, it seemed like now would be a good time to get it all in the record. Maureen, did this go through the, uh, the zoning board as well for approval for hours of I'll tell of you that the, in the, at some point, and I would have to check at some point, we changed the ordinance so that prior to that time, a conditional use permit had to be obtained from the Board of Zoning Appeals, and then you had to come to the Planning Board for site plan review. And at some point, which I'm going to have to look up the date, because I don't trust myself if it's more than six months ago, um, there, there was a change to the ordinance because the Zoning Board was using the same submission requirements that site plan review uses. So there was a streamlining of the ordinance where um, if you were a project that required site plan review by the planning board and you were a conditional use project, the planning board would do both the conditional use review and the same site plan at the same time as a concurrent review. So I, I would have to check to see which way this one went. My guess is that the planning board did both of them. Does in that the, make sense? Yeah, in, the, in this approval of this planning board approval of October 28, 1997, it lists the condition number four that the hours and days of operation be as stipulated by the zoning board. And then later on in number nine, it says that the zoning board conditions be noted on the plan. Do we know what those conditions are? I don't have them committed to memory. No, I no. can well, look that up for you. So that means that this one originally did go through the zoning board for a conditional use permit and then um, came to the planning board for site plan review. Okay. Other questions? Well, let me just clarify. Um, the October 28, 1997 letter that, that I have, more, are these the only conditions or the conditions that were? Those were con the conditions that were uh, placed by the planning board on the application as part of the site plan review. I would, while everybody thinks of more questions, I would just like to raise a couple of things. We've had a fair amount of opposition to this, and I think we need to look at that very, very seriously. Uh, the other thing is, you may contend that you want to have infants, but you can have whatever you want. I think somebody brought up the fact that you could just hire another person. You'd have to come back in front of us to get another parking space. But there's no, you wouldn't necessarily have to have, you could actually have 20 children if it's only one teacher for every 10 children over two. No, it's, it depends on the age group. No, I know that. Yeah. For every child over two, you only need one teacher? No. What is the regulation? There's uh, infants of four to one. Right. Toddlers can be up four or five to one, depending on the age, two, two and a half, and then mm -hmm. uh, preschoolers can be ten to one if they're all four and above, but some will be three. If there's three to five, they can only be eight. There's a lot of 
rules regarding okay. that. Okay. Well, then okay. hypothetically, you could have three teachers and easily have 20 children. No. Yes. You would have no infants. But what I'm saying to you is that it's fine that your intent is to have infants, but I think we need to be mindful of the fact that you may not have the rest infants. Right, but the major need in Cape Elizabeth is infants. I understand that, but the need, actually not the need can change, and these people, we need right. to be mindful of that. Right. that. But I'm not asking for, um, I mean, I am requesting for 20 max. Oh, I understand that. Right. It won't go above that. No, but you made the point about having children and they wouldn't be in the playground because they're infants, and, and that ne may not necessarily be true. And we have to assume that it's not going to be true, that it's not going to happen that way. Because hypothetically, they could all be in the playground. Yeah. And, and you could have 20 children who rotate the playground, and then we have to consider that that's that much more noise and that much more time in the playground. So are there questions that other people have with without having the original? I, I have one question. If the calculations we have are correct, your current play area, you indicated, is about 1,500 square feet. So that, in fact, you can already legally have 20 children in your current play area, apart from zoning. In other words, you, can, you don't need to expand the play area in order to accommodate 20 children. Is that right? Um, not sure. Uh, 75 square foot per child, I believe, is what uh, is, re is required. Right. So that's 1,500. So that's 1,500. Yeah. So actually, you can meet the state requirements without expanding the player. Right. I think right. that's OK. Another question I had um, seems that one of the concerns is that you're moving this playground even closer to your neighbors than it is, which I think raises additional concerns if you want to move your fence even farther towards the property line. <coughs> Would it be possible, given the topography of the property, for you to expand the playground in a direction that's away from? That's the where the major expansion is happening, away to the towards the parking lot. Okay, I guess yeah. maybe that's one of the confusions with the plans that we have in front of us. Yes. Um, I find it very difficult to tell from your plans what was originally improved, approved. Right. What's originally, what's currently on the site, and what you're proposing to do, and yeah. with that con confusion, I find it very difficult to assess your proposal. Okay. Well, in, on this sheet here that was done by the surveyor, the fence is currently right in the middle of. I'm afraid my eyes aren't good enough. Do you, you have a copy? Do you have a copy? That's. My question is, is what's shown there, is that the current fence, the current fence? This is the current, the this is the current fence. This is the current fence right here on the surveyor's copy that you should have. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And where are you trying to And then it? on the copy that I drew up, I'm trying to put it to the edge of the parking lot. Okay, but it's still expanding on part of your property that's near your neighbors. As opposed to... Well, every, every, you know, the, the, the Mark Boulder built his um, rental property be right directly <coughs> behind my property. So anything there would be near his tenant's property. But I guess my question was, would it be possible for you to expand more in the direction of either Patricia Drive or Scott Dyer Road as opposed to expanding in the direction of your neighbor's house? Well, currently there's a large tree. You know, there are a lot of um, trees buffering the whole entire play yard. So I'm not sure what the requirement is as far as um, there's, you know, the road, Patricia Road, and then there's a, a good size space, and then there's uh, the play yard. I don't know if there's any setback rules to moving the fence out that way or not uh, towards the road. That I, I didn't even look into because I didn't know. Um, it, it just exactly. seems if you were to bring the play area and the noise farther away from your neighbors that it might be less of an intrusion. Well, we don't want to bring the fence any closer to the road. The play yard to the right, further to the road, because that's not very safe. 
So the only thing that's going to happen is if you look at this plan here, the fence already stops here, and that's probably five feet from his property line. Mm -hmm. And all we're going to do is take that fence and take that kink out of it and straighten it out. Okay, so it'll stay five feet away from the line, and all it's going to do is move this in this direction, whatever it is, 20 feet, 10 feet. So that's all that is, is just taking more space that we already have. It's not going any, really any closer to his line. If, if you look at the line, this, see how that jots off? But it is closer to the house. As, as I see the house on the survey, to the extent you move in that direction, which I believe is west, to the extent you move the play area west, you are closer to the corner of that home. If yes, but still away from the property line, which I think we're in rights to put the fence on the line, if I'm not mistaken. Well, except that, you know, among the conditions that we are entitled to consider as part of your conditional use permit is the impact of noise on your neighbors and the impact of what you're doing on the property values of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So your right to change your conditional use is subject to those criteria, both of which are included. I don't, well, as far as sound travels, I don't think five feet is going to make any difference. Well, if the, if the, the question was moved, to bring it around the other side of the building so that there is, is more, some kind of a sound barrier. You can't bring it around to the front of the building. I mean, that's... It's all I slope. Can't. You mean this way? Heading towards that, the street? That's, that's a full slope. And down the street. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things I can't tell from your plan is, is anything about the topography of your land. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Why I'm asking the questions. Yeah. It's a split level, so they're, you know how they're often built on a slope because the back is, uh, has windows and doors mm -hmm. and, and the front is level to the ground. Well, there's already a tree there that blocks most of the yard from the street, so when the people that live in here come out of here, there's a big bush here that grows up and then there's a tree in the front that more or less acts as a sound buffer for the these two homes over here. Now, in order to move the fence closer to the road, we'd have to take and move it closer to these other homes on this side. Mm -hmm. The home has been there before this other lot, before uh, Mark put his home in there. So when he bought the land and built the house there to, to rent it out to someone else who doesn't even live there, we were already there to begin with. So when he bought the land, the daycare was there. So he didn't have a problem building next to us in that sense. So now, all we want to do is enlarge the yard and move it along the side of the house, and that's all. So as, uh, far, as, as far, far as, as the, noise goes, I think that as far as the infants go, the toddlers go, and the preschoolers go, that they're still going to be separated and going out in groups. They don't go out all day. They go out maybe an hour before lunch and an hour after before they... The parents like man. to come in and see the kids out in the yard. So they may go out from uh, 3, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, or it may be from 9.30 nine, in the morning. It's not nine, 7 nine, in the morning. Nine, they don't go out first thing in the morning. 10, They're 10, at 9 to probably 10.30 before lunch, and that's it. They, they nap a lot during the day. They and in the wintertime, the they, they're not out there at all. No, not much at all. So if you want to take how many times they're actually out there and how much noise they make and compare it into years in, in a, you know, how many days in a year, they're not out there that much. And there are other kids in the neighborhood, like the lady said, that he likes to go out and skate around and, I hear other kids in the neighborhood having fun too, and I don't see that a problem. Maureen, is there a, a noise ordinance or standard that this type of facility has to meet? Uh, the noise standard that would apply would be the noise standards under the site plan regulations, and those noise standards typically work with uses that are permitted in the district. So. What you could, I mean, you could have someone go out there with a noise meter and measure what the noise is. Um, the standard would be, if you can hold on just a moment. Um, and I'm missing a page. Noise. I'm missing a page. But it's, it's um, section O in the zoning ordinance. The maximum permissible sound pressure level of any continu continuous, regular, f or frequent, or intermittent sound of sound source of sound produced by any activity on the site shall be limited by the time period by the budding land uses listed below. And I apologize, but for some reason, page 209 is missing from my ordinance. <coughs> uh, anyone who has it, I can, there's a chart that goes with the decibel level. Thank you. Um, and the chart says um, this. 
heart is listed by <coughs> abutting use. Um, the abutting use is residential, and from um, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., the maximum decibel level is 55 decibels at the property line, and from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., the decibel level is 45 decibels at the property line. So if, if the applicant can demonstrate that they can meet this noise standard, or then we shouldn't really care where they put their fence. If they can meet the standard, then... Well, well, I think we do need to care where they put the fence and what goes behind it and whether or not we require additional landscaping if we approve it. Uh, sure. That would be your opinion, but... Um, I, I said if, and yeah. I didn't say my opinion. I yeah. just said if we should approve it. Right. There's another thing here, too, that I noticed. We all had, and I know I read this somewhere, um, we all had attached to some uh, uh, Maureen's initial explanation uh, the original approval. And it's, it's fairly explicit. Daycare facility approved for no more than 12 children, blah, blah, blah. That a minimum of 10 feet be maintained between the edge of the pavement and the adjacent park property line, particularly in the upper parking space. Since you have found that your original survey was inaccurate, I don't know why it was, but there was a, I'm sure you didn't know about it either. Um, does that, is that condition now no longer met? Because you're slicing off part of that lot that's no longer yours, and it appears on this drawing that it might be very near where the parking is. Those two spaces. Unless they're not paved, I don't know. Oh, they're not paved. The two spaces, they have walked under them. There's no pavement in the parking area? Oh, there's pavement. Just these two. Okay. On the upper right-hand side, you have two parking spaces. Correct, and that appears to be where the property line has now been moved. Oh, the fence line. Yeah, well, not the fence line, the property line. It's been moved farther back from our property line, from the looks of it. No, actually, it looks as though you sliced off a piece of it. You know, I'd, I'd like to point out that this conversation, this very moment, Elaine's comment, mine originally, goes back to the fact that we don't have a site plan that shows an accurate property line and the proposed work. I don't see how, I don't feel comfortable making a decision on this without something like this that shows where they want to put the fence, the distances between the pavement and the property line as corrected, so that we can make a reasonable decision. I, I'm. I keep juxtaposing all of these things and trying to figure out where everything is, and all I'm doing is guessing. And I know how to read a site plan, and I still am having a hard time with it. So I, it's a difficult enough situation when you have the care of children, which is so important and lacking in Cape, and residents who want a peaceful existence. That's difficult enough, but when we can't even figure out what's going on in a site plan, I agree. It makes it double. I agree. And I'm also wondering if we don't need to look at this site to see where everything yeah, is. I, I, I think I that this is. Uh, I do. But before we do accurate. that, I would want to have the, the plan. plan. So I don't think we can. I, I don't think we're at the point where we can schedule a site walk. No, I want a plan first. I agree with you, yeah. too. Definitely. And I don't mean to cause you more cost. It's just impossible with an old plan, with an with an inappropriate line and a new plan with the appropriate line without the, the work. proposed work on it, it's just impossible. I, that and a site walk would really be necessary in my mind. Mm. Is but everybody, I, anybody not going to It's right. I mean, how do you stand there on a site without a reference? Oh, no. You gotta have, I mean, we've got to have the plan first. Yeah. And, and I would I'd like to point out one other thing. Um, it, it, and this is historical. Um, that there have been representations that have been made that haven't been carried over as far as conditions go. And I've heard representations being made here tonight as well that, that haven't quite matured to a condition. Um, Owner-occupied, 
um, the hours that the children will be out playing, um, things of that nature. So I would suggest that to the extent that you intend to limit yourself, that you proffer that, if you will, as a condition so that we can consider that as opposed to imposing that. Um, and, and including that, I would consider landscaping, the, the fence itself uh, as far as materials, um, the signage as far as, you know, to the extent that you have any diagrams or, or you know, mock-ups of what that might look like, it will help us in our consideration. And I think it will help your neighbors as well. Okay. I'd like to ask one other question, and, and not of, um, of Lisa, but of the others on the planning board. I'm a little mystified by the wetlands issues, which in my lack of experience doesn't seem to exist. I don't see how adding eight children and fencing in property that already exists endangers a wetlands buffer that is what looks like 150 to 75 feet from the existing play yard. I, can anybody else give me any edification on this? Because it, that makes no sense to me. I mean, I understand we have a wetlands buffer. I understand the 100 feet applies because of the regulations, which is fine. But it seems to me to be <clears throat> more, <clears throat> excuse me, more of a convenient argument than a realistic argument that adding eight children to a backyard that already exists and moving a fence is going to, thank you, <laughs> is going to... Uh, endanger the wetlands. Can, does anybody have any more information on that? They can well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like it would increase. There's no increase in impervious surface, so right. I, I don't right. think that. <clears throat> I guess and one question I would have on that, and again, it goes back to the plans we have in front of us. Apparently, in the original site plan, there was a <coughs> configuration of paving that was approved but never carried out. I would want to see what the original paving was that was approved and what the current paving is in fact to st again so that we can take into account what the original planning board may have considered which would be paving proximate <coughs> to a wetland which I think is relevant I think the extent to which you know the original plan here was not carried out is something that we need to be aware of and so that would just be something to show show us the original site plan and then show us all of the changes that you that you intend to result from what you're doing including what's now there if it's a change from the original site plan it should be shown as such even if it is in fact currently existing on on the surface well the, the original site plan that you have right before any changes were made and what you have isn't even what's there well, that, well, except again, that the, the way this is drawn, if, perhaps I'm not understanding this, but I see six parking spaces marked as nine feet by 18 feet. My understanding is that that was not on the original site plan that, that you have drawn that in. Is that correct? No, this, this area was here. But did, the original, did the original site plan show six spaces each marked night? Nine by eighteen feet in the location that you're showing. Yeah, well, yes, it wasn't it did. marked off though. It did. Right. Yes, so it now did. I'm getting so two six answers. spaces on this side. I'm sorry. The original that you have. On that, just six on that side. Six on this side. Yes. I think that's what this plan has to show. We need to see. But that isn't. Oh right, the, he didn't. He didn't. The original plan, I think, he was going to add more um, tar down here. He was going to actually add more tar here and over here. He didn't do that. Okay. As, as the original owners did not change. I understand that from yeah. your perspective, yeah. the fact that somebody before you failed to comply with the site plan, yeah. you might not feel that that should apply to you. But from our perspective, giving a new approval, that's a relevant factor that we need to take into account. Well, if that was the case, then that would allow us to enlarge this parking lot as it already is. So that may I mean, be the case. Yeah. Whatever the original so you want site plan was, we need to have that in front of us. Whatever the result of that is, we need to be able to analyze what the planning board approved 
and not only what changes you're making to what sits on the face of the earth today, but what changes you are making from what was originally approved. Okay. Yeah. That's well said. Yeah. So we're not making any changes now, but you just want to see what we have, what, what remains there that they did not change, that Correct. they had drawn up. Yeah. Correct. Well, but now you also the, have that lot line to contend with. Right. And well, there was that requirement in the original approval, okay. which at least visually, unless it, the drawing, the, the plan drawing shows differently, seems to me to be something that you'd need a conditional. Okay. Well, that's what was approved. And that would be and, a change. And the meaning is ten, the it meaning says is that a minimum of 10 feet be maintained between the edge of the pavement and the adjacent property line, particularly in the upper parking space. That's why we need the current. I, I can actually shed some light on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the original applicant owned two lots the lot that the applicant, the current applicants have brought forward, and the Bowdler lot. And the applicant at that time was unwilling to do anything that would expand onto the other lot, but was also unwilling to make any commitment to the planning board that they were um, got needed buffering. And that's where that standard came in, because the prior applicant was basically, and the prior applicant brought the wrong lot line in. They own both lots. It wasn't really a focus. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that point came in because the, app, the prior applicant was basically trying to have his cake and eat it too. The problem is that it is yeah. a requirement. And, and in order, to, in order to, I mean, to consider an approval, if we have something that was approved previously that is different now because of that change in a lot line, because of someone else's error, we still have to consider that. We still have to say that's a change in an approval. So we see, need to see that too. We're, we're kind of belaboring it. I think everybody agrees that we need a site walk, that we need a Plans new plan that is. Walk. Now, my only good concern is, Maureen, how much advance notice do we need to schedule a site walk so that the abutters can join us? And you're welcome to join us on a site walk. Well, for, you, for you usually, you, yeah, usually you don't schedule a site walk until you have a regular meeting. And usually you, so I mean, you're basically putting this, putting this off for two months. Because what you would need to do is have the applicant submit an app, a new plan next month. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, you would schedule a site walk sometime between May and June. That's what we need to do. We need to do. Do everybody agree? Anybody who feels differently? OK, so do we have a motion for the board? Peter. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a simple motion to table. I, I move that we table the application of uh, Kim Newman to increase the size of Comfrey Cape Daycare located at 111 Scott Dyer Road from 12 children to 20 children be tabled until the regular public meeting in May 20th. May 20th, 20th May 20th, 2008. And, Maureen, when would be the filing deadline for? I'll, I'll send them a letter that will give them that information. Okay, the, and if the applicant submit a revised plan per our comments tonight uh, by the appropriate date and time for that meeting. Any discussion? I don't know. Does the applicant want to be heard on that at all? Any, any questions that you have about what we're looking for and when it needs, to, well, you can find out when it needs to be submitted by from Maureen, but. I guess I, I, don't, I don't want you walking out of here without a clear idea of what we're looking I, for. I think I understand that you want an actual, everything that I drew up on here, on a plan that is done by the survey. Right. So it's more clear to you where the fence is exactly going to be. Relative. Parking spots. Are and if you have any questions about what that needs to be on the plan, I would suggest you talk I to I guess I'd, I'd almost say it in reverse. Right. We don't want... We don't want this information on here. We want this information on a site plan. So we want your surveyor to start with the existing approved site plan from 1997 and then add the survey information on top of the site plan, not the other way around. <coughs> right, because that allows us to see the, what was originally approved 
and compare it to what you want now. Right. I think. Well, you have what was originally approved, but that's this is I, what I, is I, actually there. We don't. And this is the lot line. If we were to take this lot line and put it on this, then you'd have what is actually there and proposed. But we need to see what was approved against what was there as well, so that we can. Well, you have all that, I think. No, it's no. we don't Just have that on the, one. The point. problem is um, to the applicant, Mr. Mr. Newman. Hmm? They don't. This these people don't have the plan that was approved in '97. I okay. have it in my file. But they right. don't have a copy of it. So they just have what you've submitted. We also okay. want it in one place. I understand. Yeah. Okay, work with Maureen. She, she, she'll help you. She will. Okay, uh, all in favor? Anybody opposed? So moved. Who seconded that? Uh, Tom seconded it. Kim, I apologize. I called you Lisa. I thought, Kim, I saw Lisa on the page. I apologize. And the public will be notified um, when the site... No? no, we usually don't do that. Okay. Uh, oh, if you want to know, it'll be... The site, the site walk will be discussed at the May meeting. May 20th. So if anybody's interested in coming, make sure at least one of you is here to find out when that is. So we'll schedule it that night. <coughs> All right. In by the sea, uh, site plan amendments. Hi, do you want to introduce yourself, Stephen? Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Steve Bradstreet with Oak Engineers, uh, representing uh, the Olympia companies for the In by the Sea LLC. In regards to um, additional site improvements on what we call the ocean side of the In by the Sea, all previous uh, uh, plans that have been before the board have been approved and amended. Um, have been on what I would call the, the road side. What we were uh, looking to come back before the board for uh, two things tonight. One are, is for some additional improvements on the ocean side, which include walkway rehab, walkway relocation, and uh, landscaping. The uh, plan before me or behind me uh, has the existing walkway that wa is along the front property line towards the ocean being reconstructed with uh, concrete pavers. That <coughs> then loops up around the back of the pool and then the what we call the serpentine, serpentine walkway that's in front of the garden suites uh, was located in this location which was a little bit more remote from the suites. We've brought it up closer, a little bit more intimate, I guess, is the way they were looking at it, and then have the individual walks. All those walkways were existing. Um, we are just relocating those. The other um, area, and this is all uh, concrete pavers, the grand sort of promenade that comes out of the front lobby and heads towards the beach, currently has uh, two walkways up at the head with a planter in between and then it goes to a single walkway. Uh, we are now uh, looking at proposing a double walkway all the way down with planters, seating walls, and then little uh, seating areas off to the side. That is uh, being proposed as granite pavers rather than concrete pavers. 
what we're doing is there is an arc sidewalk in this location that's existing that will be removed. Um, there is um, in this area, because we're within the 250 foot setback, a requirement that no increase in impervious area other than what has been grandfathered uh, prior to January 31st, 1989, I believe is the date. And um, there was a misunderstanding there, and that's why these plans were revised at uh, the 11th hour. We had additional improvements. We scrapped all of those, and we are just showing this, and there was no increase in impervious area. There's actually a decrease of 209 square feet. Um, the only other area that is being changed is in what is called the side yard wedding area. There's no hardscape, there's no landscape, it's a regrading. Right now it's a little bit irregular and we want to come in there and, and regrade it and make it a, a smoother area. Um, and then the shuffleboard court, which is concrete at this time, will be replaced with a bocce court, which is a pervious service rather than impervious. Uh, pervious surface. So we're actually decreasing the amount of pavement in that area. Those are primarily the um, uh, total improvements in that uh, area. Uh, there is uh, the spur here by the back of the pool is for a fire pit, um, which uh, is shown here on, on the uh, plan. The second item that is all sort of site related. The second item is that in December of 2007, um, the Inn by the Sea went back to the uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, got an increase in the amount of parking that would be allowed at St. Bart's, uh, increased that by uh, 20 vehicles, which equates to 80 addition, additional people that would be able to attend. Um, meetings at the meetings or functions at the inn. Um, we also uh, submitted a letter. Uh, there was a concern that if you have now 80 additional people, how does that affect the septic system? Um, that was evaluated by Al Frick. Uh, there was plenty of capacity that was submitted to the town and Bruce Smith has reviewed and approved that. Um, so there is no difference there, but what that allowed them to do is to be able to keep their meeting rooms open rather than closing them. Uh, they are not asking for an increase in their outside participants in um, functions in the outside. It's still at the 150. Uh, the restaurant is still open, uh, which was part of the original uh, approval. But the meeting rooms that were originally as part of a condition to be closed would now be able to be open because we have the parking uh, to accommodate that and the uh, septic uh, sewage facilities uh, can handle the additional uh, uh, visitors. Those are the two, two changes. It's primarily the additional parking and how that uh, impacts and then the improvements to the site. Uh, one thing that um, Maureen commented in her uh, comments to the planning board was that the town engineer had not reviewed the plans and he had not but I did talk with him uh, right before coming to this meeting and actually emailed him and uh, in regards to the impervious area um, and because I am now decreasing it below existing rather than the increase of 5400 square feet uh, he did not uh, see that there was and he had approved the 5400 foot increase uh, that there was any uh, issues with the impervious area um, that was being proposed. He has not seen the plans. And I do have an email uh, from him at about 5 o'clock today that I can share with uh, the board if, uh, if you so desire. That is all I have. I, th I think there, there are two things. Um, one is something that Maureen wanted to bring up. The second is uh, that we're not required to find a fi for a finding of completeness for the site plans, but we might want to decide by consensus that we have adequate information. But Maureen, why don't you mention first um, an observation? Uh, you had Steve, uh, yes, the condenser. Um, yes, I I 
had a call from an abutter, mm -hmm. and I went out to the site this afternoon at 5 o'clock yep. and found a very large metal structure Correct. immediately adjacent in front of the mechanical building. Correct. It seemed very large. Correct. Very metal. Yes. <laughs> if, if there, was, there was a concern by mm -hmm. the abutter with the okay. potential noise. Uh, there was a concern by me with the visibility. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if you wanted to. Okay, I can address that. The original plans that were approved for the road side of the project showed that on the plans, and what it showed was an X. There is a outlined. Uh, unfortunately, this is the only plan that actually shows it. I had it noted on here for clarity. There is the transformer that was has always been proposed. The fenced-in condenser area is this fence here with the smaller rectangular box that has an X in it. That is the condenser. And then the larger box is the mechanical building. And if you look at the elevations that were prepared by TFH architects in the previous submittals for the, the front of the building, the mechanical building in three elevations show a solid wood fence that goes up to the peak of the proposed mechanical building and totally shields that large metal condenser. And that was all approved in the original front yard um, or the roadside uh, project uh, plans. So that is not a change from the plans other than there was a question, I understand that, was it a condenser or a compactor? It's not a compactor, it is a condenser. Um, yes, it's very large, but the screening that was um, shown on the elevations and approved by the board will be going up. They are just not up now. So what you see out there is a, a mechanical building with a very large metal uh, condenser next to it, uh, but that was previously approved. So that all will go behind? Wooden, I mean, that will all go behind fencing as? That will be, it, it is a solid wood fencing, and I, I'm not sure of the detail, but it is solid. You don't see the condenser at all through the fencing. Well, since it was previously approved, and this is just in construction, I don't think there's anything we correct. have to say about it. Okay. So does everybody agree that um, we, that we have adequate information then uh, perhaps we should see that memo if you have it with us maybe yes with you you can just pass it around just um, start over there that'll be fine okay um we're, we also have a are, are you done steve or do yes you i am okay we have a public hearing scheduled for tonight unless somebody has anything until they have to ask first anybody okay we'll open the public hearing anybody who'd like to speak got in by the sea Oh, good evening. My name is Ray Neveu. My last name is spelled N-E-V-E-U. And we live uh, right here. We're at 32. We're the closest of butter. And um, my presence this evening is informed by a request on a part of the planner, city planner, that we discuss a couple of items. Um, first of all, the, the people working here have done a great job of not bothering us. <laughs> Um, there's never any noise to worry about. They've come and talked to us. They've been very good. When the wind blew all that trash into our yards, they came and picked it up. Um, we still have a problem with illegal parking, and I wish someone would resolve that. When I go out my, my driveway here, their illegal parking uh, cuts off my sight line to the traffic coming this way up 77. And there have been a couple of close calls. I don't want to go to the police on this, but that does say no parking. And I wish someone would, would bring that. I've tried to bring it to their attention. That's a small thing. If you stand out here by the beach, what's emerging is very beautiful. We're all going to be very proud of this. Which um, brings up my problems, because uh, when, I, when I went to see the, the town planner and I said, these things have, have appeared now, this huge shed, utility building, then it was rotated 90 degrees, and then this concrete platform was built, 
and this condenser appeared, and then another concrete piece appeared, and the, that green box appeared, that much is some kind of electrical thing. Um, I could not get an answer to my questions from the town planner as, as to what that was all about, and one hadn't been approved. I'm told this evening this is all moot, uh, and it may very well be, uh, but there are still two issues here. One is environmental remediation, and I'm certain that the fence and all of that will keep the people coming in here from being bothered by that because they're trying to go from four to five stars and, and just people just can't be bothered <laughs> with what's inside there. But I can be bothered because there's a real risk here of the creation of negative externalities, which means that any of this, uh, this cooler or condenser blowing its stuff up, blowing the stuff out of there, with the prevailing wind coming this way can cause me a lot of grief in terms of noise, in terms of pollution, air pollution, and in terms of sight. And I'm told this is not going to be a problem. But I haven't been, I have no guarantee this is not going to be a problem. And so I'm bringing it up just to be sure we're all on the same page here. I don't want to have to come back a year from now and say, that's 85 decibels. When the approval is what, 50? 50? 55? at the lot line. Now, we've been through this before with the south, the south lawn, and I said, we were the cause of that noise, not them. But I do have very serious concerns, and I'm raising them here this evening for the purpose of making sure everyone's on the same page as to what is and not going to happen when these things go into effect. Those are not silent machines. And as to what's going to be inside that building, uh, which has appeared now much larger than I thought it was initially, What's going to go on inside there is not clear to me either. And again, the, the city planner could not answer my questions, which is why we ended up walking the property today to make sure we all understood what was there. And so I'm asking the collective wisdom here to explain to me that this is why this is not going to be a problem on our property. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak, please? Thank you. My name is Cynthia Doucette. I live on 43 Richmond Terrace. It abuts the strawberry fields that were there until last summer and then in by the sea. Um, I have three concerns and I started watching this at home on TV and I might have missed part of it on my way here. But my, most, my biggest concern is that I believe the inn is asking for increased capacity with having functions outside as well as inside. No. That's not oh. right? That's what I thought it said in the notice that I had. Outside. They're capped at 150. Right, but they want to also have functions inside at the same time. Yes. Well, my concern is that the Inn by the Sea is still on septic. And I live at Crescent Beach, and I can't help but think that impacts the beach and the stream that many children play in, my children did when they were growing up. Um, and I really feel like if they are going to have increased capacity that they should have to be on sewer. Um, there's just, there's, there has to be overflow into the stream, into the beach with their septic system. Um, my other concerns are uh, parking, whether they will, with the increased capacity of allowing both inside and outside functions, whether they will allow parking in the bike path as they have done in the past. And the third thing is I would like to know whether they pay fees to the state park for the guests at the inn to be able to go to the state park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? <coughs> Here comes somebody else. No, no. <laughs> I just had more of a curiosity. Oh, Carl did at 500 Ocean House. Curiosity question about the, the traveling parking that's going to be at the St. Bart's, the 80 cars. 20 cars. 20 cars. Oh, 80 people. 60. Is that what you think? It's actually 60, Barbara. Because at the last meeting, it sounded like there was going to be 60 cars. 20 for additional. A total of 60. Total of 60. I was curious if. 
if there was a big wedding at the church or a prominent Catholic died and the lot was filled. There's a, on, there's a condition in there about that. And if something, is that how long a lease is that? And five years. Five years. And the drivers are kids or... Are the people going to drive themselves and walk? I, I was just, I'd never heard anything about that in the... They've done it in the past. It's valet parking. Okay. Thanks. Well, is there anybody else new who would like to speak? I'm going to ask the board if we're going to let this gentleman speak again. Certainly. Okay, the board says yes, you may speak again. Thank you. Dr. Nevy here again. Um, the previous speaker talked about uh, the problem with sewer and septic. Uh, that has been visited on our property in the past, and they've worked very hard to try to resolve it. But I must tell you, it is not resolved. And we are, we are gifted with tremendous odors every once in a while. And then the trucks come running over, and they open up the thing. And, you know, the next few hours are a real problem. Uh, but I thought they had resolved it. I'm not, now, they have an increased capacity with people. I haven't thought that through. You may want to pursue that again to be sure that the metal odors that come out of, because those holes are between the house and the property and our property. They're, they're very much, I'm not even certain, to be frank with you, that when they installed all of that, they didn't take some of the city, pro the town property. There, there was a 10-foot um, right-of-way between the end of the inch property and beginning of our property. It's, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it a right away so everybody can have access to the cemetery, which is really good stuff. But when they were putting all that in, I was asking them where their property ended and where this town property began, and it kind of just shrugged their shoulders. Well, that's maybe for another issue. But the next time we're visited with those odors, I guess I'll have to file a complaint. I've really put up with it for a couple of years, and I don't want to cause any trouble for the end. They're too nice of people. They're trying too hard, but I don't want to have to live with those orders. Thank you very much. Okay. Come on back up, Steve. <coughs> Why, is it all right with the board if we talk about the things that were just raised? So do you want to respond to yes. some of the items that the okay. letters um, As far as the illegal... Oh. Uh, I just want to, before you dive in, yes. if that's all right, I pulled the approval, the amended approval for the mechanical building. Yes. It doesn't look like what was approved, what's on the plan right now. It's been rotated. May I see it? Yeah. Do you want to say anything about this? Well, let me, let me check it one more time here. Okay. I, I will uh, address some of the other comments while okay. um, Maureen Please. is working through files. On the uh, illegal parking, I know that um, there has been an issue with uh, parking on the street. I know that the enforcement have, has come down, has instructed them to park elsewhere. Um, I know that they have tried right now. From what I understand, there's a number of workers on site, and parking is limited. Uh, but that is 
a code enforcement or a law enforcement uh, issue, and I think that needs to be brought up with the owner to make sure that they do not park on the road. Um, I, I do agree. I, I was out there last Thursday and saw vehicles on the road, so I'm sure that it is a concern with people exiting their driveway and not being able to have the sight distance. So I do not dispute that. Um, but I think the only thing that can be done is through law enforcement to keep them off of the shoulder. That's not pertinent to the site plan amendment that we're dealing with now. Okay. So No, but that was something that was raised. No, I realize, but just to clarify. The, in regards to the mechanical building and condensing and everything, I... Can I, yes, if we dive in? So I've pulled my, my records, and I am, I, I, my assumption is that it's a very large construction site. Yes. And that there are changes being made all the time. What I have in my file, I only remember you coming back to the planning board to amend the approval for the mechanical building once. Mm -hmm. And what I have in front of me is, is a letter to Scott Tees dated September 20th that the mechanical building was approved by the planning board at the September 18th meeting. Mm -hmm. So the plan I have is dated September 6th. This would be the plan that the planning board approved at the September 18th meeting. Mm -hmm. And if there was a subsequent revision to the location, it wasn't something that was brought back to the planning board. Because I, I would have an approval letter. And if I have lost an approval letter, I'm perfectly yes. happy to apologize on record. And I'm not denying that, but I, I know with 99% assurance that the building was rotated, the uh, screening was on the north, end, north side of that, and uh, because they never, and I never would have put it on my plans or had them constructed without having approval. Um, so I think there's some more information there that I think we have to look into. Um, whether or not that is part of this approval, we're not doing anything as part of this approval. This is that is construction related. I'd like to try to stay focused. We do have other stuff to do, and and we have specific issues in front of us on this amendment. I think we uh, clearly brought to the applicant's attention. But I, I enforcement. think that, that I I just I am gonna you know I'm gonna say again that and I'd be happy to pass this around that where this condenser is shown on the plan right now. Right. in my opinion, based on the records I have, is not what you have previously approved. So if you approve the plans tonight, right. you will be approving it in that location. Well, I'm in the as-constructed location? In the as-constructed location. Which is location. not the same as, that's what I'm confused on, I guess. Right. This yeah, well, is, that's a problem. Well. If, but what are you approving tonight? I'm only asking for improvements to walkways landscaping but, but the, and parking. But there's a plan in front of us we're approving. I mean, nominally, it, it, it represents there are certain changes, i.e. the walkways that you're asking for. Mm -hmm. But if, in fact, through, let's just assume it's a mistake, this thing has been moved from one plan to the other, yes. then you will have in your hand an amended plan. So I'm, I'm certainly not ascribing any nefarious motives to anyone, but it's clearly an issue that's been brought to our attention, and I think, you know, at some level, I don't have any problem with the walkway proposed, but I'm not in a position to approve a plan that has this issue on it. So to that extent, mm -hmm. um, I, I, if, if we can no, deal actually, with that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Peter. Go ahead. If we can deal with the what's in front of us in terms of the nominated changes, uh, you know, okay. let's hash it out and maybe have a vote on it. But we cannot release the approval. Well, we can't because if this is the case, the, the view of the building is entirely different than the view that's shown on here. What we approved was this was the front of the building. Now we're going to get this as the front of the building. Right. So, that's the problem. All right, well, while everybody's looking at this, why don't you go on to some of the other items that were raised by the abutters. Uh, we do have a letter from Mr. Frick saying yes. that the septic system, but, you know, what about the problem? Okay. The, um, in regards to the sewer capacity, um, Al Frick has submitted that letter indicating what the capacity is. Um, this was reviewed by Bruce Smith just recently and approved. If you look at in his approval letter, he refers to a line of 
20,000 gallons per day, um, but with based on the water usage records, it's around 13,000 gallons per day that is actually going into the system. In our previous approval in last year, we eliminated or postponed the uh, observation of the septic fields because um, of recommendations by Alfred <coughs> that was supported by DHS and that was uh, as part of the approval also and so this system even with the additional uh, 80 people that would be coming to this has well over the capacity that is needed um, and, and you have to realize the whole the system on site not including the tanks that are on the east side but all the septic tanks that were existing around the Rose Garden are all new. Uh, they've all been uh, removed. All new ones have been put in. Uh, there's something like uh, 6,500 gallons worth of new tankage put in there. All new uh, septic system, pump station upgrade. Um, nothing has been touched on the east side of the innkeeper's house. Um, so that, if anything, it should be much better because of the, the first tanks that all the flow come through came into these tanks here, and that's sort of the, the major removal of solids in those tanks, and these are finishing, more of a finishing tanks. Those are now brand new, much better, and uh, I can't see that there wouldn't be anything but a, an improvement in any conditions that anyone might have seen out there. Um, so they were installed with this? Yes. There's, there's new tanks out there that were approved in the last uh, set of plans um, that were approved by the board. So there are, uh, that was all new tanks. So the capacity of the septic system is there, as verified by uh, Bruce and by Al Frick. We have gone before the board in regards to uh, board's uh, requests on um, public sewer and have, have shown that the on-site is accessible. Um, I'm not quite sure where the bike path is or the parking within the bike path. I'm not familiar with um, where that is, so I, I can't address that. And as far as... Uh, lodgers or patrons of the inn visiting the uh, Crescent Beach through the walkway connection. I have no idea about that. I've never been down the path myself, so I don't know as far as fees paid. I do not know um, anything in regards to that. The parking um, is valet parking. Uh, every spot on site is valet parking. When you drive in, you can't park your car. They take your car, they park it on site in available space, or it will be taken to the St. Bartholomew's Church parking lot. And, um, and then they shuttle you back and forth, or actually they go pick your car up. They don't shuttle you, they go pick your car up. So it's only for the uh, larger events that the vehicles are left out there. Um, Can I ask and, a question about yes. that? You said all parking is valet parking? The illegal parking that you were talking about, is that illegal parking in connection with construction, or was that illegal parking from this all-valet no, parking? No, no, that's construction. Right now, the, the inn has been shut down since October 6th, I believe was the date, and will be reopened in June, June 6th, May 30th. And uh, any of the parking that is out there on site now is totally um, construction parking, construction vehicles. So the concerns we heard about existing illegal parking and parking that was blocking sight lines is all construction related? I, I believe that was what was inferred by that comment. Okay. Other than addressing the mechanical building, I think I addressed everything else that was brought up by the other comments. Fees to the state 
I, and I, I do not know. I mean, if you're. I, I don't think end, that's within I our purview know. anyway. I don't really think that has anything to do with okay. the planning board. Um, there, there's only an April 7th letter from um, Bruce, or the memo from Bruce. It said something about the gray water from the proposed outdoor shower must be uh, connected to an approved. We've eliminated that. Eliminated. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? And then all we have to do is decide what to do about this mechanical building. Can I can I make a a suggestion? Um, if that is a, a, an issue with plans being approved, this is the only plan that you see that mechanical building on. It does not show up on any other plans, and it is only just an overall site plan to give you an idea of what the whole site looks like. All the other improvements are shown on the attached plans just in a larger scale. And I will gladly remove a plan, I believe, if that helps in your decision. Meaning you're willing to withdraw as part of the amendment, the first page? Well, if, if that is the issue with what is shown on there, I, I don't believe it is a problem, personally. Um, but that is something between Ernie and I to work out because I, I'm 100% sure okay. that my plan is correct. That's, um... Maureen, um, in my conversations with the applicant, um, it's very clear that they are pushing towards a, cons a completion deadline on the site. And they've made it clear that it's crucial for them to be able to complete these walkways. They want to get going on it. Perhaps the board might consider approving the walkways with a condition that the applicant return next month to sort out the mechanical building issue. I don't know if that would be acceptable to the applicant. Well, but my, qu my qu question is when can they really start work? If we approve it and ask them to come back and address the mechanical room issue, I'm, I'm kind of like the applicant suggested removing that. Part of the, the building, it's there though. It's physically on the site right well, now. Well, I understand that, but if, yeah. if we take that part of the plan that we're con con approving tonight to deal with the walkways, then it becomes more of an enforcement issue because either you have a plan that shows it in a different place or you have a plan that shows it's where it's supposed to be. And then it's more of an enforcement issue. I still would like to have them back here, but uh, I'm less inclined to hold up the walkway thing, which we all, the walkway amendment, which we all agree is a good thing to have them move forward with uh, if it can be done within what we have in front of us. I mean, my, I was drafting a proposed motion as we were chatting, you know, talking about this, and I was, my second condition was to hold the plan, but I do not want to hold up their work unnecessarily. We all want this finished <laughs> as soon as possible. Uh, I do live in that neighborhood. I pass the construction parking every single day on my way to work, and it is kind of a mess. Uh, I mean, it's, and you just never know where the cars are going to be parked over there, which is kind of unfortunate, but I, I do leave that to enforcement. So um, I'm open to the idea for the applicant, if they, and I just want to confirm, Maureen, if we do take off the first page of this amended plan, does that... It's not just... I mean, it, it could be, if it could be left in with a condition of Work anything out. regarding the mechanical building to be resolved. But if we hold the plan, that will mean to the next meeting, you, you can't... They can't construct. Right, they, until they appeal. The open May 30th, Memorial Day weekend would, would have paid that. Could we put a condition on it that he's got to work with you and work this out? Well, let me look at this language. The, to answer that question, um, the board approved this in June. Uh, the applicant came back in the fall and said they wanted to change the mechanical building. I was concerned enough because the mechanical building is very visible from Bowery Beach Road. And for that reason, even though it didn't seem like a big deal, um, sent it back to the board for a de minimis change and you looked at the exterior and approved it. I am uncomfortable with delegating that back to the planner because this is going to be visible. Delegating back to where? To the planner. Oh, planner, okay. Can you rotate it back again since it's under construction? You haven't no. put the wood up. No. The, the, the In other words, it's pad. a fait accompli at this point. You need to pour concrete pad 20 feet high metal. 
So it's an entirely different building than we approved. No, it's not. It's it's not. It's it's the exact building you approved, but the oriented. the section. I mean, I don't I don't know. I sent something around. No, you did. It appears that it might have been rotated 90 degrees in, mm. with the plans that Maureen has. So what the, looked like the front of a house now looks like a big silo. Well, sort of. If, if I, I could just send it around, you can. Right. Did we had it? Right. We it. So what you want to look at is, you approved. You approved a north elevation, and what you're going to get on the is the east elevation, as the north elevation. So, I mean, you can approve that now if you want. So we're getting an elevation that has that, no windows, none of the detail that we thought we would be seeing from the road. Apparently. Is that right? Yeah. <coughs> So before approving this, we might want to require some additional landscaping or, or other screening. I guess and any question about the noise caused by the condenser really has not changed, is that right? No. They, what, what is the decibel level on the condenser? That was reported. Because uh, as I remember, we talked about that. Yes. And um, it met the requirements at the propping line. Of Does rotating that have any effect on it at all? It moved it away from the property lines. Moved it away from the east property line. If it did anything, that's it. What would be your suggestions to buffer it better from the street since it's no longer as attractive? There's enough room. We're not, are we trying to adjust that tonight, Barbara? Well, if we're going to try to give approval, we get. Done no, with no. This. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to give approval to be done okay. with it. I you want. I want to. I want to approve this, this, the sidewalk changes and bring them back. You That's have a what, motion to make. Oh, I I, make I'm it. trying to draft as fast as I possibly can here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is not going to sound great, but no. I mean, I, I'm trying to get the applicant to install what we want installed, which is the uh, the sidewalks. Uh, it, the consensus is I think we all think that's a good idea. So, but I want to make sure that we don't sort of slip and let in something that, about, the, about the mechanical room that we don't intend to right now. I mean, my intention with this motion is to freeze the status quo on the mechanical and room into our building until we can get it resolved. So, here's my motion. I move. Well, I move that we make the following findings of fact. The Inn by the Sea, located at 40 Bowery Beach Road, is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to reconfigure the Oceanside walkways and host outside events without, without the restaurant. Without closing. Without closing the restaurant. That's, which requires review under Section 19-9 site plan regulations. Two that the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 site plan regulation. And then I move that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Inn by the Sea located at 40 Bowery Beach Road for amendments to the previously approved site plan to reconfigure the Oceanside walkways and host outside events for up to 150 guests without closing the restaurant be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the that the prior approval regulating the noise from outside events, including the use of sound blank blankets and a calibrated noise meter, remain in effect. Two, that the applicant agree to return for further hearing at our regular public meeting on May 20th, 2008, to address issues raised regarding the placement and location of the electrical and mechanical building uh, as raised in this meeting. Three, that this approval not be construed to change the existing approvals on the placement and location of the electrical and mechanical buildings as raised in this meeting. What are you intending? So you're, you're including the increased um, capacity of indoor and outdoor use? Yes. So I had some questions about parking. OK. Um, I have a motion before a second, but second. the chair. Second, OK. okay. Uh, discussion. But anyway. You've added, the only changes to the St. Bart's Agreement are adding 20 additional spaces. Otherwise, this is exactly the same as the prior agreement. That is cor correct. I noticed there's some time restrictions on this agreement, this parking agreement, that are not <coughs> reflected in your events approvals, which 
is something of a concern because you've got 60 additional spaces at some specified times on weekends. You don't have them at all during the week. And I'm, I'm sure... Whatever that agreement is and has been signed by the, the inn uh, is acceptable to them, and that is what you would be approving. But we would then be approving an increase in capacity, potentially at a time when you didn't have increased parking rights. Is that right? For example, if on a Friday morning you wanted to have an outdoor wedding and meeting capacity space, at that point you would not have adequate parking because your parking rights with St. Bart's don't kick in until noon on Friday. Then the and if you wanted to do that Monday through Thursday, you would never have adequate parking. That is correct. And then the inn does not um, allow for scheduling of those events during that time that they do not have adequate parking. But I, I guess before I would be comfortable approving it, I, I would want to condition our approval on the same timing restrictions that apply to your parking. Because otherwise, it would be possible for you to have the larger events at a time when clearly you don't have the adequate parking. Peter is typing. The, the parking agreement is for event parking. That was the intent of getting that agreement with the Catholic Church, was for event parking. They realize the restrictions on there as far as time, and if there's nothing during the week, they don't have events during the week that would require event parking or off-site parking. This uh, agreement was acceptable by uh, the inn. They signed it, they, and uh, so they will not have uh, those type of uh, events during what would be considered off hours according to that agreement. So they would not object then to our conditioning our approval on that in fact being the case that events only uh, that the approval for these um, additional capacity <coughs> events is only for the times specified in this St. Bart's agreement. We could condition our approval. That would be acceptable. I'd just like a little clarification from Maureen if she happens to have the other um, agreement that was prior to this one that had the 20. Is the, it the, same? Is the, the other, same? yeah, the other agreement um, did not restrict it to weekends. But we had had, we, there's two things the board may want to consider. One is the inn, when we had this review on the whole outside event, provided us with schedules and attendance. And it was pretty clear that their schedule was Friday night, Saturday. I mean, they, they've adhered to the weekend schedule that would fit within what they've needed. The other thing we have learned anecdotally from another board member is that um, there have been occasions when the inn has been able to, by picking up the phone, get some additional parking from St. Bart's for a special event. And instead of conditioning your approval on the specific times in that agreement, you may want to make it a little broader to say the times when additional parking is available from St. Bart's so that it, it triggers this agreement. But if there's a special case and they're able to make an agreement with St. Bart's, if there was ever a question and we, and we had complaints, they could go ahead and say, well, I did make additional arrangements and it still fits in with the approval. If I may, I think we just need to condition the uh, motion so that the, uh, the ability to have increased number of guests and outdoor and indoor combination is only while this, yeah, this agreement is valid and in place. There's a 14-day cancellation period in here. So during the time frames and only while it's valid. And I think that's really what we're looking to accomplish. Well, and to the extent that it's valid, because at some points it's valid for only 25 spaces. If they get permission for a specific event, um, that seems to comply with the agreement. Can't we just say when so, you know, here's my, I, I'm, I'm proposing to amend my motion to add the following conditions, that the applicant not hold outside events at days or, and or times of the week in excess of its license agreement with the Roman Catholic Bishop of Portland. 
they have an agreement. If, as long as they're complying with the agreement or they get, you know, complying with this agreement, get permission for extra spaces, they can do that. Can you read that again? Sure. I'm open to suggestions on the language. That the applicant not hold outside events at dates and or times of the week in excess of its license agreement with the Roman Catholic Bishop of Portland. That covers this agreement. The only question I have, Maureen, is when they do ask permission, so to speak, for one-shot deals, it doesn't seem, this agreement doesn't seem to necessarily cover that. I mean, they, in fact, get the permission and they use it. Um, I well, I guess it's what I would consider is it's a loose verbal extension of this written agreement. I agree with you. Because they have a prior written agreement, they're working with each other. And, you know, it is a business in the town. And sure. I mean, my prior experience with this particular business is that when they want to hold an event, usually it's supported by the town. Right. And having to run in there with the planning board approval isn't really going to help things if they've sorted out all the other issues. Uh, I'm comfortable leaving it with the language that I proposed under those circumstances. Second the amended motion. Any other discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Okay, five to one. Thank you. Five and four and seven opposed. Thank, yes. Just a uh, clarification. So that at this time means that the Sidewalk has been approved along with the landscaping. Right. Yes. The parking yes. has been approved as conditioned. Yes. And that um, the mechanical building location, layout, arrangement, whatever, will be confirmed. And if I am wrong, I will be back on May 20th. Right. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it this way. If the issue is not resolved by May yes, 20th, yeah. we'll, we'll see you. Okay. We'll see. Yeah, and, and if you know, work with Maureen, oh, because if there are some, I know you do, um, but maybe there's some other things that can be done to mitigate this change if you're wrong. If you're right, then. I'll be back to admit it. Maureen right. will admit if she remembered wrong too. So we're we're all on we're all together on this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is uh, the is BA wetland zoning amendment. Um, just to introduce this, because I'm assuming a number of you are here about the BA wetlands. Um, just to introduce this a little bit, the town council, we're, we're considering the entire BA district, and as I told you, there's a forum <laughs> tomorrow night. We get to do this twice this week. Um, but the town council asked the planning board, all of, the, all of this stemmed from the comprehensive plan. Actually, about two years ago, the council, there was a request to uh, consider making a change in the setback for the wetlands only for the BA district. And the town council decided not to consider that at all until the comprehensive plan committee had a chance to discuss it. And since I was on the Comprehensive Plan Committee, I can tell you we spent a lot of time discussing many, many, many things, including the setback for the BA district. The Comprehensive Plan Committee, which included 12 of us and was staffed by Maureen, voted to, as a goal, have the correct committee look into whether or not the setback in the BA district only along Shore Road, because that's the only BA district that's affected, be changed from, excuse me? You said Shore Road, and you mean Route 77. I mean Route 77, I'm sorry. Thank you for your correction. Route 77, be looked at to change that setback, the buffer, from 250 feet to 100 feet. As we explained earlier this evening, there are f four other conditions under which the buffer can be 100 feet. 
one of which we talked about tonight with a comfy daycare center, which is if you have six or more buildings in the area, it's considered dense and you can have a 100 foot setback. And there are some other conditions too. The, the um, town council has now asked us to look at this right away because there is an applicant. Actually, there are two applicants in the BA district along Route 77 that are affected by this. Um, so that's why it's before us tonight. We have written a draft, which doesn't mean anything. I mean, we may take the draft and throw it in the garbage pail, and we may take the draft and turn it over to the town council for the next step, and we may take the draft and throw this away altogether and recommend that the town council do nothing about this. Um, and we may recommend that we wait until tomorrow night and discuss everything as a whole. So that being said, um, the code enforcement officer determined that no expansion of use is allowed for non-conforming properties. And most of the properties on Route 77, I, if not all of the business properties, are non-conforming. Is that correct, Maureen? Yeah, we don't have the exact number because we don't have an exact location of the wetland boundary. But we expect that most of them have a problem. Okay. So they're non-conforming at this point. And one pending application was pulled from the planning board agenda. And there's a second one that also is has affected been, at this point. But it, the second but one has been. other constraints. Right. But they also, there are also some wetland factors yes. affecting that one, too. Yes. Anyway. Um, now, as for the, the content of the amendment, I'm just going to turn this over to Maureen and let her talk to you about the content. Go ahead. Okay. And it, what we've tried to do, um, if you want a copy of the amendment, we have one available here. It's also posted on the website, as well as um, a, a description of where we are with all these different zoning amendments. But under Section 1969, which is the Resource Protection Districts, uh, there is an amendment where we list, there are currently four criteria under which a buffer can be reduced from 250 feet to 150 feet. The fifth criteria that's under discussion reads, the Resource Protection 1 Critical Wetland District is located in or adjacent to a property located in the Business A District, which is served by public water and public sewer. So that would be the text amendment. The second text amendment is also located in section 19-6-9, and it's listed in the permitted uses section. And in addition to allowing expansion of nonconforming structures subject to the provisions of nonconformance, there's another line that's been added that expansion or change of a nonconforming use where the activity is permitted in an abutting district and is located in an existing building or paved area. So if you are uh, in a, an area where, uh, for example, an RP1 buffer where we don't allow commercial activities, you could relocate into a building that is in the RP1 buffer as long as you were not expanding the building or you were not creating any more paved area. So it would be the kind of expansion that would have no physical change. And if that is a permitted use, uh, it's listed as a permitted use that would require a resource protection permit uh, from the planning board. So there would still be a review of that, presumably to make sure that those conditions are met. So those are the two text amendments. Does anybody have anything to add before we open the public hearing? Anybody? Okay. Public hearing is now open, and please, again, come up to speak, state your name and address clearly. If your name is complicated, please spell it for us. I can also tell you we have had many, many emails about this, and we have them all right with us and have read every word, believe me. Hello. My name is Jane Snearson, S-N-E-R-S-O-N. And I live at 7 Salt Spray Lane. In the past 20 years or so, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth and have been rewarded with a sense of well-being and impressed with a sense of community. These meetings reinforce that. Of course, there have been times that I have disagreed with some of the decisions made in this room. Intelligent people have often disagreed with each other. My greatest concern occurred when the Broadcove Association on two occasions, 
asked that Jordan Farm Road be opened and paved to provide a, a second access to our development. Both times we were denied uh, based on the decision that wetlands would be disturbed by the widening of this small dirt strip to accommodate emergency vehicles, as I understand, are required, a uh, certain width is required by the city. Um, that strip remains barricaded and chained. At least twice, mothers attempting to get their children to doctors were delayed from doing so because of wetlands. Now you are considering easing the restrictions regarding another patch of wetlands to accommodate a building. It perplexes me that a road which could potentially save lives has been turned down because of wetlands. But the expansion of a building toward wetlands, a building which would attract more traffic at a curve and an intersection and could potentially contribute to the presence of dangerous drivers and dangerous conditions is being considered. I urge that you study this carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Joseph Foley, and I reside at 511 Ocean House Road, immediately adjacent to the BA zone. I'm here tonight to ask you to vote to deny the request for a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance that would reduce the RP1 buffer from 250 feet to 100 feet in the BA district. Has there been a recent inspection and mapping of these wetlands? Do we know if there are any vertical pools located here? What about endangered species? Approving this proposed amendment will forever change these wetlands in our town. These wetlands are a very important part of Cape Elizabeth and are a part of the Great Pond watershed area. 83% of people who replied to a survey by the Land Trust stated that they were in favor of keeping the wetlands as is. These wetlands help with both the spring and the fall runoffs in this area and provide a habitat for many of our wildlife in town. These wetlands provide a necessary buffer between developed and undeveloped land. Is it possible that we may be taking things out of order with this proposed amendment being put in place without any guidelines or business in the BA district? Is this a change for the benefit of a few and to the detriment of many. Recently, I have heard a lot of discussion and read many articles in reference to saving the farmlands in Cape Elizabeth. Sad to say, I've not heard or read any articles about saving the wetlands. You, the members of the planning board, have the ability to change that tonight. You can stand up and take a position in favor of, state of saving the wetlands in Cape Elizabeth and I urge you to deny this request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Foley. Next speaker, please don't be shy. My name is Jack Orr, O-R-R, -R, 505 Ocean House Railroad. And I'm going to be very brief. In, in making a wetlands change, if one is to be made, it's extremely important that we know where the wetlands are. This is a problem we've bumped into before. So that you have, this is great, <laughs> you have all these lines, but if you pass a new buffer, the buffer isn't going to follow regular lines like this. It has to follow the contour of the actual wetland. The wetland contour is not even, it's jagged. So you get into some real contests when you try to put a straight line next to that, next to the, uh, uh, the actual wetland edge. Bringing, bringing a buffer into 100 feet means that an error of just 10 feet is 10% of your boundary is gone. The, I think the burden 
to be able to establish the actual boundary of the wetland is on the town. It can be done. There are people who do this. And they, uh, they go by, not just by the uh, wetness of the ground, but more on the vegetation. And they walk the perimeter of this thing with a uh, globe positioning device, and then you want. So I would recommend strongly that uh, we, we take that approach. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dan Fishbein, Salt Spray Lane. Uh, and I can assure you that my comments tonight represent the opinions of many of our neighborhoods and uh, our neighbors in Broad Cove that my wife and I have spoken to. I want to start with a question, though, Barbara, because of a comment you just made. You mentioned that the town council asked you to consider this. Did, what, is, did the town council do that, or did the town manager do that? Maureen. I think actually that we had something about the town yeah, the, the, the council originally recommended that this be one of the pack. This is an amendment in the comprehensive plan that the council has asked the planning board to work on, and I had placed it in one of six packages. And the planning board is working on packages of amendments, and the manager asked us to pull this out of one of the packages and expedite it because of the impact on a, on a current applicant. Right. So I just want to clarify, there's no resolution from the town council requesting you to take this out of sequence. The town manager made a request for you to take this out of sequence. And that, that's an important distinction. Um, the council asked us to consider the BA amendments, which include, this is one of them. But not necessarily. Not amend, uh, not excuse math. me. In, to consider the, B, the goals related to the business right. district as a right. whole. That was one of the things that was passed down to but us. What's, but what's before you now is a specific request to take this part of the BA overhaul and the comprehensive plan yes. recommendations in the BA out of sequence with the rest of the BA overhaul. Tomorrow night you're holding a public forum to begin getting input on the BA overhaul. Correct. And this is part of the BA overhaul. And there's a request in front of you from the town manager to take this out of sequence to accommodate the needs of an applicant. Generally, changing zoning, and I would consider this to be part of that, to accommodate a, a single applicant is what's called spot zoning. And that's something that's generally inappropriate. I would strongly suggest that if there is a BA overhaul, that you take all aspects of the BA overhaul together. All of these pieces interact. It's complex. The comprehensive plan made a series of recommendations that you should consider. If you take one aspect out of sequence, you open up the ability for things to be approved that a few months later you might be denied based on other uh, ordinances you would adopt as part of the VA overhaul. There's no good justification to create a window of loophole here so that one or two applicants can get something approved that later on would not be approvable under the BA overhaul. So I think there's really there's one and only one choice. And I'm not taking a position, by the way, on this particular provision. I'm not necessarily opposed to changing it. But you need to do this all at once. You need to table this, not necessarily approve, not reject. In, incorporated into the BA overhaul discussion. Also, last night, some of us get to do this three nights in a row, by the way. Last night, the town council referred to your request to develop a bar and tavern ordinance, which is highly integrated with the questions of what will be happening in, in the BA overhaul. All three of those things need to be considered in tandem. To do them out of order creates an unfair opportunity for things to happen that otherwise wouldn't be approvable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cynthia Doucette, Richmond Terrace. Um, I am opposed to reducing the 250 buffer to the wetlands to 100 feet. I believe the businesses that are along that stretch already were grandfathered in a long time ago. And I think that when the 250 foot buffer was established, there was a good reason for it. I also think that um, there's room in the town center for businesses to be established that haven't been established, especially where the, there was a former gas station, now just an empty parking lot. Um, and I also would like to say that I, had no, I was not aware 
uh, beforehand that there would be that Rudy's would be allowed to uh, become a pub and serve beer and alcohol, which I am not happy with. And I was not aware that there would be a building built um, on their land, which changes the the uh, environment that we live in. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gail Schneider. I live at 511 Ocean House Road. I'm not in favor of reducing the wetlands buffer from 250 feet to 100 in the BA districts. I'm concerned that there have been no recent scientific studies of the area between Ocean House Road and Great Pond, part of the very sensitive Great Pond watershed. Are there vernal pools? Are there endangered species? Um, there was a great, there was a survey of Great Pond completed in 1997 by Scott Williamson, an aquatic biologist, at the request of the Conservation Commission. To protect the water quality of the pond, he cautioned that the watershed and land use around the pond must be monitored carefully. Williamson was especially concerned about the non-point source pollution, which comes from among, from among other things, automobile exhaust residue, salt, and stormwater runoff. He advised it's better to protect the pond than to try to have to restore it. The Conservation Commission proposed a Great Pond Watershed Overlay District in a zoning ordinance to protect the pond. This RP1 overlay was subsequently passed by Town Council. Here we are, just 11 years later, proposing a decrease to this overlay ordinance to accommodate business expansion. There is an increase of paved surfaces proposed, as well as an increase in traffic. All this without guidelines in place for design or business usage in the BA district. This zoning change doesn't make sense to me, especially in this order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Marl Spreitz. I live at 524 Ocean House Road. Um, I'm not very familiar with the, the technicalities of of wetlands, but last year on um, Patriots Day, uh, something that I tentatively identified as a vernal pool showed up in my basement uh, for a couple of days. Um, That's not. I, I I really have no uh, knowledge as to whether 100 feet or 250 feet is the proper setback. Um, I do think it's, it's really important that we know where these wetlands really are, as other people have stated. Um, and I, I think it's really very important that this uh, motion that's before you is considered on the merits with the intention of trying to protect wetlands. Um, I think it's it's much more important that we protect the wetlands, the vernal pools, the waterways in the town than it is that we don't want to jeopardize that in favor of expediting the expansion of a watering hole, which just showed up recently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Patrick Babcock, 503 Ocean House Road. Um, it's best that I write these things down, and uh, I'd also like to thank my wife for being here to censor me on this topic. Um, you just made sure to not, or you just made sure to uh, not to slip in a mechanical room. I'm kind of paraphrasing the last 45 minute issue. Um, that was in conflict with the initial plans in regard to the in by the seas desire to complete their side walkways. It appears as though the town council has allowed a bar or the planning board or someone here. In he had nothing to do with that. Who, someone, true. Someone though, someone in Cape Elizabeth who has some sort of authority has allowed a bar to slip into my backyard while addressing the issue of Cape Elizabeth's comprehensive plan and potential 
rearrangement of the BA wetland setback. The two questions I would have, of course, are why and how. How is this bar legally allowed to be put into use when it is a clear change of use in the current location, that being, of course, Rudy's of the Cape? So I ask you, our elected town councillors, to please be very contemplative, very methodical, very careful, very thoughtful, and very diligent when it comes to the entire legal process that is involved here in regard to the potential reduction of the wetland setback. Thank you. Thank you, but I do want to point out we're not the elected town council. We're the planning board. Actually, the planning okay. board, the town council. Thank you. <laughs> anyone involved, the crickets, the birds, and the wetlands. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carl Best. I live at 12 Tom Hugh Road. Uh, I came here tonight to personally encourage the committee members to give careful consideration to the proposed changes to the wetlands ordinance. Uh, we know about the wetlands and what they provide this community. They're the basis for much of the de desirable sights and sounds and overall appeal that we experience living here in this town. I think that we'd all agree that this is a wonderful community to live in and we're all very fortunate to share a space here. We also know about the proposed change to the ordinance and what that would provide. For a few, it would offer the opportunity for expansion, new development, and certainly the prospects of additional revenue. All good things to be sure. But for many more, however, a change to the ordinance would pose a serious detriment to those same sites, sounds, and activity levels surrounding our neighborhoods. One thing is certain, reducing the wetland buffer from 250 feet to 100 feet will definitely provide for change. But for a majority of us, that change will ultimately result in a negative impact on the privacy and the property values of all of those residents living in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would wish to speak? <coughs> I'd like to thank all of you for keeping your comments distinct and brief. And believe me, we're listening. Thank you. I'm Martha Duncan, 196 Two Lights Road. You have a copy of my letter, which I gave to Ms. Omira today. I just want to reiterate my opposition to changing the wetland uh, amendment. I think Mr. Foley and others have spoken eloquently about why we feel that the wetlands should be protected. And this certainly is a change that should be entered into um, with a great deal of forethought. And I think, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, spoke about the proper sequence of doing all of this, that all of this needs to be combined and not taken piece, piecemeal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Christine Morgan. I live at 507 Osh House Road. I'm a concerned citizen of Cape Elizabeth. I live approximately 250, mi 250 feet from Rudy's, which is the actual amount of uh, wetland that we are at now. Uh, my concern is, is that every day I take, pretty much every day I take my dog for a walk. And I see a lot of wildlife. The other morning I was walking and I saw this two deers and two foes trying to cross the street in front of Two, two lights, I mean, uh, uh, with the good food. To reduce the wetlands would be, be pretty significant to wild, wildlife, and that's all I'm going to say. So I'm, very, I'm very concerned about our natural wildlife here in Cape Elizabeth. It's a beautiful place to live, and I'm proud to live here. We need to be conscious of the decisions we make when it comes to what we see every day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Anybody? <laughs> we don't My name is Carl Pearson, I live at 27 Fowler Road, and I'm also the proud owner of Jordan's Lawn and Garden, uh, one of the properties in question. Uh, I didn't prepare anything to speak or say about, I wrote to you guys previously, um, and we met with you in the planning board. All I want to say is a couple different things, and I intimated this in the letter that I sent to the planning board. Uh, one is that everyone that's spoken made valid points in all the different directions. Uh, I just want to point out a couple things. One, I think we're going down a wrong road, sort of, as you said, uh, but you can't prevent something from happening 
and using the wetland zoning as sort of an impetus to disallow or stop something that someone doesn't like. Um, when you state wetlands, I have the wonderful distinction of being on the council when the wetlands ordinance was approved uh, back in 89 after 25 drafts at a minimum. Um, at that time, the state, and it still is, a 100-foot setback in most wetlands, wetland areas, shoreland zoning. Cape chose to increase that to 250 feet. Uh, what the merits were, it just seemed like a good number, perhaps. A lot of the people have spoken, and not just this part of town, but others. Uh, and if you talk of the history of Cape, a lot of the neighborhoods where you're enjoying your livelihood and benefiting the wetlands, I mean, you know, the fauna and the, the wildlife, essentially filled in wetlands. So, you know, if you're looking at Cape and its rural character, just as I said, take a moment to realize that you're benefiting from what now is disallowed. Um, you can't plan things and cause zoning to happen backwards, out of order, as you mentioned. Uh, but when you see part of the rural character of Cape Elizabeth being destroyed, that's what caused the council to say, we've got to look at this. We've got to stop the development. We've got to come up. And as I said, it was a struggle. 25 drafts is quite a bit. And if you've sat through all the planning boards and zoning boards and workshops and everything else, it's quite a process. So you've got to applaud these folks for giving their time and energies. Um, all I want to say, as I said, is I agree with, I can't remember which gentleman uh, that said that there should be mapping. And I think that's at the uh, town council's uh, responsibility because you can't keep on having different persons, different bodies, different professionals saying this is, that isn't a wetland. If you go back to history, Maureen said one time, it has nothing to do with it, but Route 77, which is now has the strip and whatnot, that wasn't there originally. You used to come into Cape Elizabeth, you'd go up Hillway, you'd come down past Jonesy's where it was, which is now Balfour's real estate, or Caldwell Banker, I guess it is, and then you'd meander down around Old Ocean House. You'd come up past what Rudy's is now, and you'd sort of go up two lights and down around the other way. So you'd avoid natural drainage areas, which, which excuse me, at the time were not necessarily wet. 77 caused a lot of those wetlands, which in some respects, not to be disrespectful of wetlands, but are nothing more than highway marshes or bogs. The original drainage, talking to the old farmers, actually worked very nicely. Where St. Bart's is, that used to drain wonderfully all the way down through Broad Cove neighborhood and into the ocean. Naturally, with all the wonderful sandy meanderings. Same thing on the other side where Lester Jordan's farms behind Rudy's. That used to be a nice drainage right off the natural topography. So did the roads create those wetlands? Were they naturally occurring? Or were they in fact man-made? I'm just, you know, once again, I'm not going either side here, I guess I have a bias because I do have a building which is allegedly within a 250 foot buffer. It's operated there for 40 years, pitched towards the road, so I don't even know if there's any impact. Uh, there was a, another addendum, or addendum made to that uh, language, uh, I think it was the Hatem uh, Amendment, um, which was very nice, and as I said, this is part of the planning process. And I think everyone, once again, we've got to work together if you it truly, indeed, enjoy Cape Elizabeth as a community. And once again, I, I've got to put this one little injection there. My dad came up this weekend, and after working until about 11 o'clock at the store, we did go to Rudy, excuse me, it wasn't 11 o'clock because they closed at 9. So I guess it was 8 o'clock. We actually went over to Rudy's because that was the closest place to have a bite to eat, as we had eaten the previous night at the good table. Um, and I won't even say where that's designated as far as the wetland. Uh, and we had a nice time. There were three or four lawyers. There were several insurance agents. We had a nice time, and we enjoyed a meal and a beer. Uh, it wasn't a bar, per se. It was a restaurant. It was a meeting place. It was a greeting place. And as I said, there was a good mix of people there. Uh, there were no discussions about the Patriots in the parking lot, and we had no Rothschild, unfortunately. Anyways, um, that's all I've guessed. I'm babbling on here. Uh, I know you guys have a tough decision here, uh, and I think oh, one other point too, as far as the town manager, the town council, who decided what, the town council I think has had this before them for four and a half years. So I think it's about time that it moves forward. Whether someone 
gave them a direction to get something going. You can't tie up business, you can't tie up progress. I think everyone's got to work together and you've got to do it in the spirit of getting along and not being this school against that school. So I guess that's my piece. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Hi, I'm Mary Page. I own the property at 517 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. I just sat here for two hours and listened to the first two applicants that stated they were in the RP1 buffer zone, and that they were granted to be able to build because of impervious surfaces and densely populated areas. And not one of these people who love these wetlands so much stood up in regards to any of that. And we started this quest four years ago to change this when these wetlands were discovered. And the town, you guys had approved it, the planning board approved it, sent it to the town council, the town council in turn sent it to the um, Conference there you go. Conference of Planning Reviews, thank you. Um, they did have stipulations which to hook up, you know, it would be a BA zone, it would hook up to the city sewer, um, which we did, again, at, at a tremendous expense to us, again, to be able to have this and be able to utilize this. I have two buildings behind me. I have a brand new 5,000 square foot building that is 80 feet behind me. I have the good table, which is also 80 feet behind me, which is in the wetland, and that is due apparently just to an error in their survey person or something because it's there. And the only thing I'm asking is that, uh, you know, we're not building anything, we're not adding impervious surfaces, we're hooked to city sewer, and just asking for the same courtesy. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Jan Corey, and I live in South Portland, but I'm a quarter owner of a property at 509 Ocean House Road. I guess I want to ask, what is it you want Cape Elizabeth to look like in 10 years? Because part of that responsibility rests on your shoulders. Do you want more business along that strip? What kind of business? You didn't want a Dunkin' Donuts farther up where people could gather and chat. So what kind of properties or businesses do you envision if you put this setback, push it back? So, you, you know, I mean, do you want a coffee shop? Do you want more bars? What do you want to encourage along that strip? And the same thing in, South, in uh, Cape Elizabeth, uh, Shore Road, Cookie Jar area. We're asking that question tomorrow night. Yeah, that's right, so exactly. you've got 24 hours to think about it. <laughs> I'll call you out there. You want to know what everybody else thinks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm closing the public hearing. Okay, open it up to the planning board for discussion. Well, the first thing that occurs to me, and a couple of people have mentioned this outright, and Carl Pearson mentioned it in an interesting way as well, is I think people need to be aware that Mary Page is not going to have her liquor license pulled if the buffer doesn't change. She has, it, I mean, Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong, but she has her liquor license. She has hours that she has to um, abide by. Abide by, thank you. Yes. And that's not going to go away. It's a going concern. It's a going concern. So whether it goes from 250 to 100 or 250 to 500, the liquor, no, it won't go to 500. The liquor license isn't going to go away. So I think, every, I think we need to at least acknowledge that for, for those who are concerned that there is an establishment serving liquor, and if those people feel that that's going to go away if the buffer stays 250, we need to, be, we need to make them aware that, that that's not going to happen. So I think to that point, we need to address the wetlands issue 
as a wetlands issue, which in my opinion needs to be addressed as part of the whole BA district investigation, research, development, and compilation of information. Maureen, I'd like to ask a question. There, there was a question, there were several people who talked about the, <coughs> where the, the wetlands are. And if we don't know where the wetlands are, I do think we need to encourage the town to do a very thorough, to send a specialist out there and do a survey if we don't know exactly where the wetlands are. With greatest respect, respect. I would like to point out that when this amendment came before the planning board two years ago, and it wasn't four and a half years ago, it was two years ago, um, I asked the planning board at that time, did you want to map the wetlands? You have some funding at your discretion. And you said no. You felt it was important for the burden to be placed on the property owners rather than borne by the taxpayers of the town. I'm not disagreeing with that decision. but. This question of where the wetlands are has repeatedly been raised. I am more than happy tomorrow to pick up the phone and hire someone to map the wetlands if someone authorizes me to do that. Well, and, and, and at the time, because it was uh, the amendment that we considered in 2005, is, is, it was more of an isolated request rather than as part of a BA overhaul. Same amendment. I understand. I'm just, it, its genesis was different though, Irene, and that's why I'm thinking maybe then it was the right idea to leave uh, the responsibility to individual applicants because we really didn't have anything specific in mind when we pulled, when we worked on that proposal. But now that we're looking at as part of the comprehensive plan uh, to a revision of a BA district that is impacted by significant wetlands, that now is the time to step up to the plate as a town in that area specifically and say, you know, where are the issues um, if we're going to consider this amendment? And I, I do agree that it should be part of an overall review of the BA district. I just want to be clear, and I don't want to get off your point, Maureen, too far, but I do want to be clear. This, and, and this goes to the issue of how did this come back in front of us sort of so quickly. This was originally brought up in 2005. It was sent back to the council with a favorable recommendation by us with no specific idea of Rudy's or anything or Carl's proposal or anything else. Um, and, and the town council didn't say no, it just said, well, this is better reviewed. Um, and, but again, it was a positive rec recommendation from us. This is better reviewed as part of the comprehensive plan. So when it went back to the comprehensive plan, who came back again with a positive recommendation and again was put in the packages that Maureen, Maureen was uh, was putting together as part of our, over, our, our, our complete overhaul of the uh, zoning ordinance due to the comprehensive plan. It was only pulled out, so to speak, um, among other reasons, because we had already considered it before and gone forward uh, outside of the proposals. Um, why don't we stay on the wetlands issue? I do want to address the, quote, Hatem Amendment. If I'm going to take credit for this, I do want to explain the genesis of it and why. But why don't we stick with the, uh, the wetlands issue? first and then move on to the, that issue. So, so we have um, sort of two proposals here and, and we'll take any more. One is that we, it is appropriate for the town, and if we have any money now, maybe for us, we don't even know we have money, okay, that we take our money. How much money do we have? <laughs> Let's never, not go never, crazy. Never. But, uh, <laughs> do we have enough to do this? I believe you have more than an adequate amount to do this. The planning board annually has a budget for special studies that the council sets aside. Most years you don't spend any of it. You have used it in the past to help out the Historic Preservation Committee. The, uh, the illustrations that are in the ordinance for the town center plan were paid for by, by the planning board. So on occasion you have used that money. Here's my question. Are we going to ask to map the, all the wetlands throughout the town, or is it just those that impact the BA? Only the BA, yeah. because we, you don't have enough money. we don't have enough money right. for the whole town. <laughs> well, but, but this is what we're, we're considering right now, and I think that if we're going to make some rational decisions, and we're asking the public to come forth tomorrow night and give us ideas about do we have design standards? You know, what kinds of things do you want to see in the BA district? Uh, what kinds of businesses? Uh, how do you want this done? Do you want sidewalks? No sidewalks? You want I mean, that we need to have some some kind of we need to know where these. It appears are. to me to be a rational 
course of action that since the comp plan has been recently approved that we look at the BA in its totality and one component of that is the wetlands another component of that is the maximization of the business districts right, within right. the town so to take it out of order seems to me to be illogical irrational to the extent we have funding that we can actually map the wetlands let's do it and, and I, Marlene, do we have a motion about that? Oh, I, I, I just have one more question. The, and that would only involve, of the two areas we're really focusing in on, the Shore Road. Um, Shore Road? The, no, Route 77. Uh, Route 77 and then the one. The, but the Shore Road has no wetlands. That's so why that's I want to confirm that on the record. Yeah. No, they, and, and I'll have another map that looks like that tomorrow night that we can put them next to each other so you can see both VA <coughs> districts and you'll see no green on the one for okay. Shore Road. So the funding that, we're, we're, and that I think we're trying to push forward now is really just for this particular area. Right. Yeah. BA with critical My expectation nearby. is there is an RP1 boundary line that extends roughly from behind Rudy's to potentially as far south as Golden Ridge Lane. And we have information for the property behind Rudy's. We have some information for the property behind Golden Ridge Lane. And that's why I'm using those parameters. So, you know, if authorized, I would hire a consultant the town has used in the past um, and have that person walk that line and provide both the RP1 and the RP2 wetland lines. And, and based on your experience, and I'm not asking you to speak for them, how long will that take? I'm thinking right now that it won't take that long because, you know, everything's a little slower. And, <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, I can't, I can't guarantee it. But my guess is, you know, we won't be waiting a huge amount of time. But I can try to get an answer before tomorrow night so that I can at least let you know. That's fair. Could we have a motion well, about this? Cause before we do minutes. that, Barbara. Um, <laughs> Sorry. We know I know you're in a hurry. Um, are we going to have uh, property owner issues uh, with people um, allowing a consultant to come on their property and map their wetlands? I'd be happy to contact the individual property owners, and if they say no, then I guess we may have a problem. But We'd have an um, incomplete map then. Well, I mean, the other thing is, quite frankly, I'm hoping I don't have to get to that point, uh, but, you know, the code enforcement officers has some authority to inspect properties, and if I have to, I can go down that road. I'm hoping we can all, as former Councillor Pearson said, work together on this. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion. Um, um, I'd like to move that based on the information presented, the Business A Wetlands Amendment that allows the RP1 buffer to be reduced to 100 feet and that allow the expansion or change of non-conforming uses where there are no exterior changes and the activities permitted in a budding district located in Section 19-6-9 of the Zoning Ordinance be tabled to such time would may be an appropriate meeting time, given that we're having a public forum tomorrow. Well, or, or to table until it's considered uh, as part of the entire package? No. Well, you could be tabled so that it may be included as part of the whole BA overhaul zoning amendment package. I don't know that that's necessarily right. fair. Okay. I think we should put a date here. I agree. Uh, and I'm, at this point, why not just continue to the next meeting? Be we'll tabled to, May, and then to the regular schedule May, 2000, yes. May 20, 2008 meeting of the planning board, period. I'll second. Okay, any more discussion? All in favor. Now let's talk about mapping the wetlands, though, as a separate. Could I make a motion? Yes. With please. regard to that, uh, I'd like to move the planning board authorize the town planner to retain an appropriate consultant to map the wetlands in the BA district on Route 77. And use planning board? And use the funds available to the planning board for such special projects. I second. Discussion? Well, I just a question, um, and I think Elaine has a comment too. Um, Maureen, that does the trick in terms of your authorization to do what we need. I mean, you don't need to go back to either town council or town manager. No, I mean, I'm going to check with the town manager and make sure, sure. We're, we're okay. Cause, but I, I mean, this has happened. We've done this many times before. <coughs> I understand. Efforts. I just don't have a sense of the budget we're dealing with. If you think what we're asking for is Under $5,000. Then, then, then I'm comfortable with that. I just didn't want to. 
I promise add another you layer. Of spend your account. <laughs> and you can have your pizza once Thank this you. year. <laughs> Tomorrow night. <laughs> I do have a question about the precedent of our doing that. I'm mindful of one of the comments that was made about the uh, wetlands issues that came up in the connection with the road in Broad Cove. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering who paid for the wetlands mapping in that case and whether we're setting a precedent here for the town paying for wetlands mapping and how we might distinguish in another situation because given that we have two cases pending before us, mm. essentially we're assuming the cost of mapping wetlands for two identifiable applicants. Well, that, that troubles me in terms of how if at some later time a neighborhood comes in and there's a question about where the wetlands is in the neighborhood, those private homeowners are going to say, well, you paid for the wetlands mapping to help out these two commercial interests or perhaps the whole BA zone. Are we now in a difficult spot and our $5,000 is growing substantially? And, and, and my, my short answer to that is we're doing it as part of the o BA, BA overhaul, District. the amendments that we're asked to do as part of the uh, uh, um, implementation of the, t of the comprehensive plan. So if, that, if they came into that, into us with that pitch, if it fit in with a different agenda or a different idea that we were supposed to do, I, I, you know, I wouldn't have any trouble doing that instance too. But it's not, this is not done, and I want to emphasize this over and over and over, these amendments were not proposed to, to help or hinder any particular applicant. This was on the agenda anyway for the comprehensive plan. The specific wetlands issue was identified three years ago, two and a half years ago, whatever. And, then, and, and it's part of our charge post comprehensive plan uh, to, to, um, to get the regulations and implement it. Scott, did you want to say something? Yeah. The wetland assessment, Maureen, um, I do a little bit of work with wetlands in. You can get different uh, products depending on what we ask for. We could get just the edge of the boundaries delineated. We could also get their function and value, which is a lot of information that would be potentially helpful knowing um, the impacts of reducing the setback from 250 to 100. If the wetlands don't have much value, then that could play a part in the decision. So are we going to ask to have the function and value of the wetlands determined as well? Um, I don't normally do the function and value assessment. I did actually inquire about the cost of doing the function and value assessment recently to respond to another question by the council on another issue they were looking at in this area and I found that it did tend to increase the cost. Exactly. Um, I usually do not ask that question because I'm looking at information that I need to apply the local wetland regulations. And the local wetland regulations do not treat wetlands of varying functions and values differently. They basically treat wetlands that are less wet one way and wetlands that are wetter, the very poorly drained with the obligate wetland vegetation, get a more rigorous protection. So if the I'd, board wants me to get the function and value, I can I'd do I'd like it. to make a pitch for that in this particular instance. I mean, I think part of what we're dealing with in this particular area is critical, is wetlands you know, layered with a, a BA district that we've decided uh, we need to foster because we don't want any more, have to expand BA districts in other areas. So it seems to me this is an instance we need function and value to decide sort of which side of the slider we're going to be moving this particular protection and or encouragement along. So, I, you know, it's, it's information. It right. seems to me this is, the, this is the time and this is the area we sort of do spend the extra nickel to gather information. That's my recommendation. And I Everybody agree? Agreed. Everybody feel good about that? And uh, I'd also just to add on to that, suggest that they budget to come to the planning board meeting to answer questions possibly. The consultant that actually does the work. Good point. That's a very good point. Very good point. To a workshop. Well. Or a meeting. The well, May 20th meeting. Or, well, if it can be done that soon, that's all. Oh, true. We're going to find that out Whenever there, yeah. Whenever the work is done. Yeah. Okay. And Elaine, just to assuage your your concern about this a little bit, we we are allotted, I think, five thousand dollars every year, aren't we? Yes. And we've only actually spent it once, and we we shuffled it over to the comprehensive plan. 
Um, and we usually don't spend it, it just goes back in. And I think, again, that it has nothing to do with the applicants. It has everything to do with looking at the BA district as a whole. And I don't think that we can make any rational decisions about how we treat the BA district on Shore Road, not, excuse me, on Route 77, until we have this information. I don't know how we make those decisions. I agree. I mean, maybe we're going to find out that we don't even have a 100-foot buffer. And maybe we're going to find out that we have a 350-foot buffer. But we have no idea at this point. And so we're sort of shooting in the dark to make some changes in a whole zone. Granted, it's a tiny little zone. But a whole zone that affects, you know, this, we have so little in the BA district that I think we need every bit of information we can have. And it's a good use of our money. I think Elaine's point is an important one. It is an a important good one point. to have on record yes. because I would never have made that motion if we were only considering two applications Absolutely. that involved potential wetland buffers outside of the context of a BA overhaul. Absolutely. Never. It's just not appropriate. So good point to be made. Any, any more discussion? One more question. Are we, I'm looking at the map over there, which is where we have kind of projected wetland edge. Are we doing the entire wetland edge or only the wetland edge as it abuts the BA district? We'd have to do the whole thing. Well, um, my plan was to focus on the edge that abuts the BA district. However, you need to at least determine that the wetland is more than two acres in size. So you have to go far enough. And if you're asking, I have to tell you, I'm looking at the area, I'm hearing that you need a 100-foot buffer and a 250-foot foot buffer location. And uh, I'm yeah, going to ask that value. if I run out of money before I run out of functional values assessment, do I get to cut the function and values assessment? No, my view is fi find out what the cost is and talk to get whoever more, we get, need. Get more money, <laughs> don't cut the work. Yeah. I'll tell you, this isn't a really good time to get more money. I understand, no. and I'm not trying to be flip here no. at all. I, I'm not, what I'm I'm not, saying I'm not being flip either. I'm just saying that if, if, if you leave it at this, and I come back with an estimate that's $5,001, mm -hmm. you know, well, then I, well, no, I, I, I'm not going to authorize the expenditure because you've given me this, and I only have this. Fair enough. And, you're gonna, and we'll be at May 20th, you'll have nothing. At the very least, we absolutely have to have the wetlands edge and the size of if, the wetlands. If we want to send them out, With why? everything else that's any more money that's left over, let them analyze as much as they can. That's absolutely relevant in terms of those areas, I think. I agree. Go as far as you can go. But if I can't do it all with the money, you still want me to do what I can. Do as much as you absolutely. can. Absolutely. Okay. Right. But well, just procedurally, let's assume you come back with whatever the estimate is, and it is over five. We can discuss this at a workshop to see whether there's some other avenue to get the, what we need done. I mean, if it's so off the chart, it's just not even feasible. Like I said, if you, I mean, if you only want me to send them out once, and you want me to go with that approach, and it's more than 5,000, mm -hmm. then I'm not going to send them out. I'm going to bring it back to a workshop. Which is in two weeks? No, two, three weeks. And, and I just need direction from you on which way you want me to go. At the very least, I think we better look at the edges and look at the size, determine where the RP1 is and where it isn't. And as far as they can go, start with the most relevant areas and let them look at, at um, what was the wording that you used? Function and value. The function and value. That's actually scored. As far as they can go with the most important parts of it. You can have credit. So no. that would be the edge to the right and below the pink as well as, yeah. It's all right. My plan would be to start around here and do this whole area down to here. <laughs> but not go up the back. You only have to go far enough back to determine that the RP1 wetland is greater than two acres. However, to determine the functions and values, you may have to do the whole thing, and I'm concerned that I can't do it for what I have funding for. But you can do the front. Maybe you can do the front. I can. Parts. I, I mean, my 
I'm assuming my number one goal is to determine where this RP1 line is. Right. Yes. Because after I determine that, then we can measure 100 feet, we can measure 250 feet, and we can start picking up how much of that buffer is still there, how much of it is gone, what impact. It may be way back here, in which case there's not that much impact on the rest of it. Excellent. What about on the other side there, though? Over here? Yeah. This is not the, this is not, has anything to do with the um, BA district, and I don't have any information that says this is anything but an RP2. That doesn't mean that there is an RP1 here, but everything that I have, which is very little over here, says it's RP2. I guess I'm wondering if you were to measure, if it was RP1 and we were to measure 100 feet, wouldn't that go into the pink? Oh yeah, you'd pretty much wipe this whole thing out. So don't we need to know that? How much money do you want me to spend? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to have that small piece down there, the anything. I, mean, I, I still think, you know, we have, we have mapping that was done on site that shows there's an RP1 right in here. We know that for a fact. We have some mapping that shows there's an RP1 down in here. We know that for a fact. So my biggest expectation is there's something going on in this area. I mean, I could keep mapping the town forever, except we don't have the money for it. So, I mean... I think we're going to have to trust Maureen's judgment. Maureen, well, I guess I'm judgment. missing the color distinction there. Maybe it's not there. We can't tell from what we're looking at right now what's RP1 and RP2. Yeah, I, there's nothing on this map that tells you there's okay. any RP1 here. I'm telling you that the planning board has seen a site plan for this property that showed there was an RP1 line right here. So we have information that has been submitted by reputable soil scientists that shows there's RP1 here. So we know it's there. It's just not showing up on the town's map because the town's map is based on the county soils mapping. The county soils mapping doesn't pick up aggregates that are less than two and a half acres in size. And it's the most accurate information we have at a town-wide basis. So we use that mapping for our zoning map. But when we go to actually develop a site, we require applicants to field verify their, their, their resource protection boundaries. And that's the note right here, which I've carried over from the full size zoning map, which says, the zoning map suggests the location of each resource protection zone, the actual boundary of which is subject to field verification. So what you're talking about is taking your special studies money and doing a field verification of the area from here to here. And if there's any left over when he's out there? Functions and values. Yes. Okay, all in favor? Oh. Opposed? Five to one. Scott was opposed. Scott, is it just you feel that we have to have the functions and values? I think you, you get an incomplete product, we're not gonna be any further along. So, I, Maureen, I'd be happy if, if the board be okay to review the proposal um, that comes from the consultant and work from Because there's other ways we, you could phase the work. To be honest, I, I usually, you know, when you ask me to get this mapping done, I usually don't get much of a proposal. They, I talk to them, and they get out there, and they start working on it. No, you mean what, what the results, you know. No, no, I'm talking about the, the proposal. No, talking about He's talking about the proposal. The proposal. Scope, scope and budget. But, you know. Which, if you want to go that route, certainly can. I mean, all of this adds time. We need to well, a proposal should add for what they're going to do. Right, to but the thing is, if there's a scope and a budget proposal that the planning board wants to approve, then you need to do it at a formal meeting. So you, you, you need to do it, you need to wait until May 20th, where you can review it, you can change it. That's, that's. No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just suggesting I could review it. My, my, my hope might be that, is there an, and there's a shot that you could get some more data to us for tomorrow, just verbally, to see whether we're even in the ballpark. I, I just don't know. I mean, and I know what, who I want to call. It's right. the same firm we usually use, and right. they're very reputable. I don't want to go shopping around either. No, that's that's fair. You know, we, we, we respect your judgment. And I'll see what I can ahead. get you for yes, tomorrow. Yeah. Put on if your you best can't. smile on the phone. <laughs> 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 All right. Now, the Hatem Amendment. The Hatem Amendment. Quickly, um, what prompted this was uh, in, in reviewing the uh, the allowed uses within 
something, essentially something that exists already and what is required before you can do that, even when it's located in an area that's now been identified worthy of protection. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I'm an attorney and I do practice in land development work in other areas. Um, and this is something that comes up quite frequently. Um, and, and in reviewing a specific proposal for one of the businesses that is out in this particular site, it seemed to me that um, sort of an ad hoc approach to these regulations wasn't really serving the town as well. And that prompted me to call Maureen and say, look, is there a way to put in the regulations a fair, uniformly applied uh, standard that applies essentially where somebody's swapping one business for another without having it become a change of use triggering massive review. Uh, and, and, and I've amended the Maureen's draft of what I had discussed with her on the phone uh, to reflect what I'm trying to achieve. And I'm going to read it briefly the way I, I would like it to read and maybe we can have some discussion on it. And I'm trying to accept um, expansion or change of use or change of a non-conforming use where the activity is three factors. A, permitted in an abutting district, district. B, located in an existing building. And C, there is no increase in impermeable surface, which is a fancy way of saying uh, paved area, but it's a little broader than paved, paved area. Um, and and it's, it's to accommodate the maximization of what we have for B, A, existing stuff, for lack of a better word, buildings and surfaces where a, build, a, a business is just going to come out of one and, and some other business that's certainly less intensive uh, is going to go in there. It, it, that's, the pro, that's the proposal I have. I'm, I'm open to tweaks. I'm open to ideas and changes that can be made to it to refine the concept. But it, it, it seems to me that we want to be encouraging that use in the existing business structure that we have because the, the clear consensus at CAPE is we do not want to expand the footprint of the business districts that we have. That's where it came from. And one thing I do want to say, I'll say it again and again, it was not created to accommodate any specific proposal. It was a way to, to amend the regulations to fairly apply to all uh, the BA districts and to accommodate what I said. Thank you. And Peter, just to comment on that, I, I think it was appropriately made, mm. and I think it's appropriately considered in the context of the overall BA overhaul. Agreed completely. In terms of the timing, I, I, I think it should be part of the package. Everybody, anybody disagree with that? No, not at all. Okay. Okay, we already voted on the BA district, so okay, we have one more. Is everybody finished? Everybody's... Satisfied? Okay, let's go on to beds and breakfast. Uh, we've been asked also <laughs> to consider bed and breakfast amendments, and everybody's going to go home. So <laughs> we have had one email about this in favor. Um, and in order to do this, we have to consider this, we're redefining or we're creating a definition of homestay, and we have added some language which will allow beds and breakfasts if this is approved by the planning board. It will go to the town council next. <coughs> so, uh, oh wait, oh no, it would go to a public hearing next, I'm yeah, sorry. Public, yeah, that's public hearing. Okay, um, do we have anybody, any discussion about this? I do. Yes. Um, after considering, you know, looking at this a little bit more, I guess I question, I think of a bed and breakfast as more intensive than a residential use. And I question whether it's appropriate at all to allow this on a non-conforming lot. Um, you know, an existing, an existing structure on a conforming lot I don't have a problem with, but an existing structure on, a sub, on an undersized lot with undersized frontage, I, I, I'm concerned about um, because I think it is more intensive than what's around it. And I think that would, that would need to change that. We'd have to have some changes um, in a couple of different 
places. Um, I think it would mean that we would always need 80,000 square feet in RA, and we would always need 20,000 the minimum lot size in, in RC. And I would also um, <coughs> keep the street frontage for a bed and breakfast the same as it is for everything else in those areas. So that in RA, the street frontage for a B and B would be 125 feet, no exceptions. And in RC, it would be whatever it is. 100 feet. 100 feet with no exceptions. I had brought that up the last time at the workshop, so yeah. I, I certainly concur. Um, could I ask, Maureen, if, if you could just go through for me um, the, how a non-conforming lot would actually be treated to the extent that there was an application for a and b um, would, it, would it go necessarily through the site plan process? It would still have to go through site plan. And, and the reason that um, they're treated different, that there's two different ways of treating them in here, is that in the discussions the planning board has had on bed and breakfast, my sense was that most of you were contemplating the conversion of an existing structure. Mm -hmm. And many of the existing buildings that we've contemplated on the older roads in town uh, were created on lots that predated zoning. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed that if your intent was to allow conversions of some of those existing structures, um, it would be thwarted if you were, in some cases it would be fine. But in some cases, especially in the RA district where you require 80,000 square feet, it might be thwarted by a requirement that it only be on a conforming lot, which is why the ordinance actually has dual provisions. One says if it's a non-conforming lot, you have to have a minimum of these certain things. The other thing that I was concerned about is while I thought you were anticipating building, putting these in existing buildings, the reality is that someone could build it brand new and I didn't want to create a situation where you made something that is a non-conforming lot all of a sudden have a particular use that you could put on it when you couldn't do any other use with it. Uh, so it, it seemed like you needed to have provisions that explicitly talked about new bed and breakfast having to be on conforming lots. Um, if they were proposed. What you need to keep in mind is at the end of each of the districts, the RC and the, the, um, the RA, and in one case it's on page 8, um, it's line 9, it says non-residential uses listed in section 1961B3 shall require site plan review. Um, actually it's line 11, the non-residential uses. So all of these have to get, any B and B, whether it's on a non-conforming lot or on a conforming lot, would be required to get site plan review. And site plan review does allow you to look at the issues of parking and lighting and buffering and traffic and uh, those typical things. And for all those reasons, I think the way it's drafted, I'm okay with it. Anybody else? I'm also okay with it, the way it's drafted. Yeah, I am, I am as well. Okay. Can I make a motion? Sure. <laughs> Move that based on... Uh, no, the, 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 we're, we're going to table it. <laughs> public hearing's next. Week. Next time will be the public hearing. I move that based on the draft text pr presented, the planning board tables the bed and breakfast amendments to the zoning ordinance until the May 20th, 2008 meeting, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Okay, all. Any more discussion? Okay, all in favor? Okay. That'll be it. Move to adjourn. Public hearings are announced. This, this is just a public meeting, but a public hearing will be next time. May, may I ask a question on the record? There were a number of other documents in our package. Were they purely informational or? Um... You mean the correspondence in the planning board? Yes. The board, I, I yes, there are, I provide the board with informational information. You know, there's notices of conferences. Yeah, I, I'm um, specifically referencing the article about um, Zoning, the zoning practice. No, no, um, da, 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 pardon me. Uh, Fort Williams? Fort Williams. That was a piece of correspondence that was 
submitted by a member of the public. Oh, she's planning to speak Parker's. Yeah, I saw that. For what but I'm not sure for what purpose. Because the member of the public wanted you to have this. Oh, really? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's not on any of yours. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? I guess we have a second. All in favor? Yeah. So it was moved by who? Uh, it was moved by Peter. Uh -huh.